All right, hello everyone, welcome. My clock says six o'clock, so I will go ahead and get us started. So hello and welcome to our Find Your Ancestors session today. I'm Katie Stilp, I'm the local history librarian here at Appleton Public Library in Appleton, Wisconsin. We're just south of Green Bay for those who aren't familiar with where Appleton is in Wisconsin. Thank you for joining us this evening for our webinar um, all about family search. We're going to do a really big deep dive tonight. Um, but before we get into the program, I do have a couple quick announcements to begin. Few, first, a huge thank you to the friends of the Appleton Public Library. They are the ones providing funding for our Find Your Ancestors series and allowing us to continue bringing amazing speakers every month. We definitely could not do this without their support. Um, so thank you to the friends. For those unfamiliar, the Find Your Ancestors series happens once a month, every month of the year. This one is a bonus session, so we did have one two weeks ago, and we're doing a bonus one this month, but we typically have one once a month, every month. Uh, you can check out the handout. I have a handout link in the chat. I'm going to post it a few times while I'm giving this announcement, and then, um, like I said at the beginning, for those who lo logged on earlier, that handout link is also in that reminder email that you got from Zoom. Um, but take a look at that handout link for some information on our upcoming program. So we have an, our last um, summer Find Your Ancestors series uh, program is going to be on August 10th. So in two weeks from tonight, uh, we're going to host Mary Riso, and it's going to be our last Thursday evening at six o'clock one. So in the summer, as we do Thursday evenings at six o'clock central. Um, so that one with Mary is going to be on discussing how to do the genealogy of your neighborhood. Um, so maybe you kind of have hit a roadblock with your family and you're not sure what else you can find on your ancestors. Well, perhaps you need to look at the neighborhood and see maybe how your neighbors are connected and maybe you'll discover that they are somehow related to your family. Um, so that again is August 10th, so Thursday evening at 6 p.m. in two weeks. So we hope to see you then. Then starting with our September session, we go back to our regular scheduled time slot of Saturdays at 2 p.m. Central. So our summer or our fall sessions are going to kick off on September 16th. We're going to be celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month by hosting Joy Oria, and she's going to be discussing how to research your Hispanic genealogy. So again, take a look at the handout for those dates and the registration links. And there's also a link to the events calendar in the handout, um, or you can go to our website, apl.org, where you can find that events calendar and get all those dates and topics for the remainder of the year. Just a reminder, even if you do register for the, any of those upcoming programs, you are going to get a reminder email a week before, a day before, and an hour before those programs begin. And that'll have the link in that email on how to join the program when we start. If you've missed any of our past Find Your Ancestors sessions, definitely check out our YouTube channel. There's a link to that in the handout as well. Of course, not every presentation is recorded or up there indefinitely, so be sure you're registering and attending live if you're able to. We had a great session two weeks ago with Christine Cohen on Homestead Land Records, and she's actually on tonight. Um, so thanks again to Christine. We have that video up for about another two weeks, so if you did miss that one earlier this month, definitely head to our YouTube channel um, after tonight's presentation so you can go ahead and um, catch that video before we're able to take it, we have to take it down. Um, we are recording tonight's presentation and I'm gonna send out a link to that in the handout, or um, if, I will send a link to that recording and the handout um, to everybody's email tomorrow. A quick reminder that uh, recording or capturing this presentation in any format without permission from me, our speaker, and the library is prohibited. All the slides and handout materials are covered by copyright law. You're welcome, of course, to download and or print a copy of the handout for your personal use, but no portion of any material may be photographed, duplicated, or shared in any way without permission from the speaker. I do have closed captioning enabled, so if you need it, you're able to push that button at the bottom of your screen. Um, just be aware it's not 100% accurate because it's a live transcript. If you do need any other accommodations to enjoy tonight's presentation, just please let us know in the chat. If you have any questions during today's session, you can use that Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen and our answer questions at the end. Since I'm the one giving the presentation tonight, I won't be able to see any of those questions during the presentation, so I will have to wait to the end. Uh, if you have any library specific questions or need help navigating any of our library's genealogy databases, definitely feel free to reach out to me. My email address is in the handout. I also offer one-on-one -on -one sessions via Zoom or in person at the library to help with uh, navigating those genealogy databases or, you know, if you're stuck on your genealogy questions, feel free to reach out. It always helps to have a new set of eyes to kind of take a look at your problem and maybe are suggest things that you hadn't thought of before. 
Then finally, at the end of today's presentation, there's a short survey that's going to pop up from Project Outcome. It's an American Library Associated or Association sponsored initiative. If you could just take a minute to fill out and let us know what you thought of tonight's presentation, um, we would greatly appreciate it. There's also a spot on the survey to let me know what topics you're interested in for future Find Your Ancestor sessions. So since I'm your speaker and host today, I'll let you um, I'll tell you a little bit about me before we dive into all about family search. So as I said at the beginning, I'm Katie Soap. I'm the local history librarian here at Appleton Public, Appleton Public Library. I've been at Appleton Public Library for five years now. I have a master's degree in library and information studies from UW-Madison and a bachelor's degree in communications from UW-Green Bay. I have been researching my own genealogy off and on since 2005, so about 18 years now. I still had a great grandmother alive at that time, and she really was the one who inspired me to research more, and um, thankfully I had a lot of great information from having her alive at that time. Uh, since then, I've been able to author three books on the genealogy of my grandparents, with my fourth and final one in the works. Uh, in addition to my role as a library, I also serve on the board of the Appleton Historical Society and as secretary of the Wisconsin State Genealogical Society. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I did see someone type into the chat about using an app to record meetings and take notes with AI. That is um, not something that is sponsored by the library. So if you do happen to see that message, please ignore it and click on links at your own risk. But that is something that's not allowed in our presentation tonight. So I'm going to get going and share my screen here, and then we will get started with our presentation. Let me share the handout link one more time, and then I will pull up screen share here. All right. So let's get our slideshow going here. I am going to turn off my video just because it's going to be in my way if I don't. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started here. All right, so again, today we are doing an overview of Family Search. And again, I'm Katie Stope. I'm the local history librarian here at Appleton Public Library. So tonight's agenda, uh, before we dive in, first we're going to cover what is Family Search, how you can access it. Then we're going to talk about using the Family Search site. So I'll give an overview of the different features that we're going to talk about, um, and then do a live demonstration of navigating that section of the site. And I'll also include some information on accessing the collections at an affiliate library or a Family Search Center, which, a, which is an important part of the Family Search umbrella. I'm going to wrap up a few quick tips at the end um, and give you some information on where you can go to learn more about using Family Search. And then, as I said at the beginning, I will do a Q&A at the end. Just be forewarned, this is going to be a fairly long session. Um, I tried to trim it down as much as I can, but I want to give you guys as much information as I can and go as in-depth as I can on the different features. Obviously, we could spend a whole hour or two on each of the features, um, so I'll do my best to give you at least a little taste of each of the features and um, give you a live demonstration and try to keep it as short as possible. But definitely Definitely, if you need to leave, go ahead, feel free. We are recording the session, so you can always feel free to watch parts of it later um, if you missed any of it or rewatch the parts that seemed confusing. And again, that handout link is in the reminder email and will be e emailed out with the recording if you didn't catch it before you logged in. I know there's always people who join us a little bit late and catch that, don't catch that handout link when I share it at the beginning. And since I'm your host and presenter tonight, I won't have the opportunity to share that link um, for the handout like I do throughout the sessions usually. All right, so what is Family Search? If you're not familiar, the website is www.familysearch.org. It is the largest free genealogy website with record collections from all over the world. It is operated by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or people often abbreviated LDS. No, they will not try to convert you. So I've heard some people um, at the library come talk to me about Family Search, and they're nervous that they don't want to use it because it is op it is operated by a church. They they think it deals with religion. They're going to try to convert you to their religion. They will not. Um, like I said at the beginning, I've been doing genealogy for 18 years. I have uh, used Family Search that whole entire time. Not once have they mentioned anything about religion or trying to convert me to become an LDS church member. So if that is something that you know is making you nervous that you haven't used the site because of that, um, I can definitely alleviate those concerns that it's not a concern at all. 
And it is also for ancestors of all religious affiliations, not just LDS church um, ancestors. And it's free of charge to everyone, regardless of your own religious affiliation. So definitely don't let that be a barrier to you using that site. So some features of family search, which we're all going to cover um, more in depth today, but this is just kind of an overview of the main ones that we're going to talk about. Um, so they're most well known, of course, for their historical records collections. Those collections cover more than 90 countries and growing. They're constantly looking at adding more um, from all those countries that they represent or adding new countries. Um, some of the records, of course, are searchable, so they're indexed. And some are not indexed, but you can still browse through the images. And I will show you how to do that tonight, because if you aren't browsing those unindexed collections, you're missing a ton of great stuff on there. There are some other important features of the site. Like I said, we're going to cover these a little bit, um, but we can't go super in-depth to all of them, because again, we would be here probably all day. Um, so we're going to talk about the family tree function. We're going to talk about user-submitted genealogies the digital library. There's a great thing called the Family Search Wiki. We're going to talk about the catalog, so it's similar to a library catalog. We're going to talk about the memory section and just briefly a little bit of, about indexing. So you might be wondering if you haven't accessed Family Search yet, how do I go about going on there? Well, it can be used anywhere with millions of free record collections and digitized books available right from home. There is, however, a subset of some record collections and books on FamilySearch that are restricted for at-home access. So where you can access these restricted collections is going to be detailed in the catalog record for each collections, and I'll show you what that looks like a little bit later today. But essentially, there's going to be four levels of restrictions. So the first level, it's stuff that you can only access in that FamilySearch library which is a standalone library location in Salt Lake City, Utah. It is the largest genealogy library. It looks absolutely amazing and beautiful, as you can see on the Family Search Library website. Um, this is just the page dedicated just to the library. So if you do live in that Salt Lake City area or have plans to visit there, you can come to their website, browse about what collections they have, what services they offer, um, get some tips and tricks about what to do before you visit, some research hip, help, all kinds of great things on this library site. And again, this link is in your handout for you. Um, unfortunately, I have not yet visited the library. It's on my to-do list. Um, but again, you know, being in Wisconsin, it's a little bit of a trek to get to Salt Lake City for me. Uh, the next level of restriction is going to be what they call a family search center. So these are centers that are all over the world. They're an LDS affiliated location, so usually an LDS church or somewhere that's affiliated with the church. They are staffed by volunteers, so of course they're going to be open limited hours. Uh, if you're local to Appleton, we do have one in Appleton over on West Park Ridge, but they're, like I said, they're only open limited hours. Um, so for me, like I work full time while well, our family search center is only open Tuesday mornings for four hours. Well, well, that's during my work day. And then they're open for four hours, one Saturday a month. And, you know, if it happens to be that Saturday I'm working, I don't get to go there either. Um, but there are other locations. They do each kind of set their own hours. So again, this is a spot on the Family Search site. Um, and we do have a link to this in your handout where you can type in your location and find your nearest Family Search Center as well as a Family Search affiliate. So I'm going to show you just quickly what that looks like. Up here in the top corner, you're going to see where it says search for a place or an address. So you can click in and put in your location. So I'm, of course, going to put Appleton, Wisconsin. And it's going to show me that map. So anywhere you see the red little book looking things, those are going to be affiliate libraries, which I'll talk about in a second. And you can see Appleton Public Library is one of them. But any of these blue um, family search icon kind of tree looking things, those are going to be for the family search center. So if you click on that blue icon, it's going to bring up a little toolbar over here that gives you a little overview of that location. Um, it's going to give you a phone number. It'll link you to their website. You can click on a link for directions. And then, of course, again, it's going to list their hours usually. So like I said, for me, somebody who works full time, you know, that's a little difficult to, to get to those um, family search centers sometimes. So thankfully, there are some collections that are available at affiliate libraries like the library. 
So affiliate libraries, those are available all over the world in existing libraries. So they can be public libraries, academic libraries, any types of libraries. So again, Appleton Public Library is an affiliate library. And I'll talk a little bit more about how to go about accessing those affiliate library collections and even those family search center locations and how you kind of tell the difference when you're from home, what it looks like from home, what it looks like at that center, and how you can tell what collections are restricted and what ones aren't. We'll dive a little deeper a little bit later tonight. And then that fourth level of restriction you might come across when you're using the site from home, it's going to tell you that it's available at a partner site. So this is usually going to be an existing genealogy site like Ancestry.com, MyHeritage, Fold3. So these are sites that require a subscription. So Ancestry might or uh, Family Search might host the index for that collection, and then to get the actual image. Um, of that record, you have to have a paid subscription to one of those sites and access that image elsewhere. So why are there restrictions, you might be asking? Well, what happens is FamilySearch, they gain permissions from the or original record custodians, so the people who originally own those records. It's usually going to be some sort of government agency because we're thinking about, you know, people's records, like their vital records, their court records, things like that. And that person who, or that institution that um, owns those records, they are the ones who set any kinds of stipulations. So for example, the Wisconsin Vital Records are owned by the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. So they are the legal custodians. They are the ones who get to say who can access it, where they can access it, how they can access it. And those legal custodians could be at a state level, could be at a county level, city or town level. It really is going to depend on the record type. So of course, FamilySearch has tons and tons of agreements with all these different organizations, institutions, government agencies, and they all have different restrictions on, you know, what they want and how they want their records accessed. So you may notice um, certain collections might have been open at one point and are now they're restricted or, you know, maybe now they're restricted and in a year or two they'll be unrestricted. Um, so of course, that's because the agreements between those original owners and family search they're going to be renegotiated at certain times thus the details of those agreements can change so i know years and years ago we could access some cook county illinois records so that was huge for people who have like chicago ancestors like myself and now you unfortunately cannot access those images you have to go to the family search center the family search library or illinois to get those records um, so again that just depends on the different agreements and as uh, those agreements are updated the the access restrictions might be updated as well that's why it's always important to save what you find when you find it so take a screenshot of the page you're on um, use snipping tool that's a really great tool on windows if you have a windows pc or often are like create a PDF. So if you go, like you're going to print a page, you can, instead of selecting your printer, you can select save to PDF. Like I use Google Chrome all the time and that's an option. It just saves that website as a PDF for me. I can pull up that information again anytime I open that PDF or that screenshot or that snipping tool just saves an image of that screen. So again, you know, what is there today can always be gone tomorrow. So be sure to save what you find when you find it um, so that you always have a copy of what you're locating on your ancestors. Affiliate libraries also have no control over what we have access to and what we don't have access to. Again, it all boils down to that original owner and their agreements with Family Search. So now, like I said, we're going to dive deeper into using the Family Search site. Just let me get a quick drink, quick. So this is what the homepage looks like when you type in familysearch.org. You're going to see up here where the sign in button is. Or if you haven't yet created an account for Family Search, this is also where you can create an account. So you'd want to click on either one of those two things to either sign into your existing account or create your account for the first time. So why might you want to create an account? Well, to use all the aspects of the Family Search site, you really need to create an account. It's completely free to do. 
Um, they've also added the functionality that you could even sign in using your existing Facebook or your existing Google account or your existing Apple ID. Um, so you don't have to create a whole username and password. If you have one of those three, um, you could either sign in with that or create your own family search account. That, again, that is completely free. So why you should create an account? Um, of course, there's this awesome tool call, called the source box. You can save records you want to view again, records you might want to look up at an affiliate library or the family search library or a family search center. Um, and we're we'll dive a little into the source box towards the end of tonight's presentation or show you how cool it looks. There's also the family tree function, which we'll talk about a little more in depth in a minute. Um, but you cannot view, add, or edit anything in the family tree unless you have a family search account and you're signed into that account. So that's a huge reason why you should take a, a minute or two to sign up for that free family search account and make sure you're signed in. And then I've noticed sometimes if I don't always sign in when I first start using the site, I start going to the search and I search for things and I see, oh, look at that record collection is restricted. Darn, now I have to access it at the library or I have to, you know, go to the family search center. But then, you know, later on, I'll be signed into my family search account and I'll go to that same record set and it's unrestricted. So I think um, they really just want you to be signed into your family search account to make sure that you're getting all of the aspects of the site. So just always make sure you're signing in before you start diving deeper into the site. After you create your account, you can just always use that sign in button at that top right corner of the page every time you use the site. Of course, you're going to want to remember your username and passwords for uh, future sign ins. So this is what it looks like when you've logged into your home page. Um, some people who have been a long time user of the site will notice that um, the home page has kind of changed a little bit. Um, so this is what it looked like a couple weeks ago and it, it changes every time you sign in essentially now because they're trying to make it look a little more social. Um, so you can see in this top right corner, we're going to have some options. You can see it has my name, so it says I'm signed in. And then it's going to have um, a couple different screens that you can click on over here. So you have your home screen um, where, you know, as people post things, um, they are going to have, you know, some cool things to share with you. Possibly if you have friends um, that you're following on the site um, or you're going to share your own memories and things like this is saying, you know, what memories do you have of your hometown? Um, so you can start writing that and then friends that you would have would be able to see that information. Um, so like, you know, a couple days ago, I signed into the, the family search account and this is one of the new social aspects that they have. So somebody added a photo of one of the people I follow on the family tree. And so now I have this photo. This is their username that I can click on and contact them if I wanted to say, hey, where did you get this photo from or um, any additional information that they maybe didn't put on that photo. Um, but again, they have these new social aspects of the site really geared towards sharing those photos, sharing those stories with others. Um, there's still really new features and optional to use, of course. Um, so because of that, though, it's going to look a little different every time you sign in if, if you are following people or if Family Search is suggesting that people you follow in the family tree, um, they're kind of bringing up some of those memories and things that might be of interest to you. You can share posts, and if you do friend someone, like you would friend someone on Facebook, you can see their posts, but your friend does need to approve you before you can see their posts, and you need to approve any friends that you um, have requesting to be your friend before they can see your posts. So if you don't want to use this site at all, this part of the site at all, completely optional again, um, and there's no way that people are going to see it if you post things to it unless you're friends with them, and they approve you and you approve them. The next little tab is going to show hints. Um, so the friends tab, if you have any friends, you could see all your friends um, there and see what kind of posts they're posting, but I don't have any friends right now on Family Search. I haven't used that part of the site yet. But the hints tab is going to show you all these different hints on all these people that you might follow in the family tree. And again, um, we'll talk a little bit more in depth in the family tree in a second on how you might follow an ancestor, things like that. Um, but from here, this is just showing there must be recent hints on these people that I follow and Family Search is trying to gear me towards researching these people a little bit more with some new hints. Kind of like that shaky leaf that you might get on Ancestry.com. 
And then recents, that's again going to show me the recently viewed people that I viewed in Family Tree. So these are the ancestors I was working on before. I can go ahead and just click on their name, be brought right into their Family Tree page. And again, I'll show you what all that looks like in a second, but this is just what you might see and what you could click on from that home page. So again, anytime you are on the site and you kind of want to get back to that home page, there's this green family search um, logo that you can click on at any time and it will bring you right back to this signed in home screen to kind of get you back to where you started. Then the next tab we're going to be looking at is the family tree section. So now we're going to do a deeper dive of what that looks like and how you might find your ancestors on the family tree. So the Family Search Family Tree is one large family tree that everyone who uses Family Search and everyone who has a Family Search account can contribute to. But what that means is that anybody can add, delete, and or change anything that you put on there about your ancestors, except for living people. So information on living people is always going to be private until they are marked deceased. But if there are photos, documents, or stories attached to a living person, others could potentially see those materials. So for example, I have a really great four generation photo of my grandma with her mom, her grandma, and her great grandma. Well, my grandma is thankfully still alive. So if I upload that photo to Family Search and I tag her in it, I tag her mom in it who's deceased, I tag her grandma in it who's deceased, and her great grandma who's deceased, well, other people are going to be able to see that photo even though my grandma's still living and it's attached to a living person, people can still see that photo because it's going to be attached to deceased people. Just be aware you cannot delete people on Family Search Family Tree unless you personally have added them. You can edit details about those persons, so say, oh, that's not the correct birth date, let me edit those details. Or you can remove and replace relationships, so say, oh, that's the wrong parent or that's the wrong spouse added, you could change those things. Or say you find two duplicates or more than one duplicate of that same ancestor of yours, your great grandfather, for example, there's you know more than one family tree page on him. Well, you can merge the two together. So a little bit about navigating in that family search family tree. Once you click on where it says family tree, you're gonna get a couple different options that you can click on below that. So clicking on overview, it's just gonna bring you to a page that tells you a little bit more about family tree and allows you to click in to view the tree. So if you've not used the family tree yet, I encourage you to kind of check that part of the site out a little bit more to go a little bit more in depth. Clicking on tree, which is the next option, is going to bring you into the family tree. So it's going to start with where you are on the tree, as long as you've added yourself. If you haven't yet added yourself, it's going to prompt you to add yourself and add some details, add your parents, things like that to get you your spot in the family tree. The next tab is going to be person. So that's going to bring you to your personal page. So like I said, every person, all your ancestors, your siblings, anybody who would have a page on Family Tree, has any person has their own personal page. Um, so clicking on that, it's going to either bring you to your personal page, or if you've been clicking around in Family Tree and working on people a lot, sometimes if you click that, I've noticed it brings you to the most recent person you've worked on instead of your personal page. Um, but for the most part, um, usually after you first sign in and click on that person page, it's going to bring you right to your personal um, kind of profile page that, again, nobody can see because you're still marked living. The next option is going to be find. So this is going to allow you to search for a person in the family tree. So you can either search by person or by ID number. So anybody who's added to the family search family tree is given a special ID number to kind of differentiate people with the same name or similar names. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like in a second when we show um, what the page looks like for each person. And then following is going to bring you to a listing of all the deceased people you are following. So again, like I mentioned a minute ago, you can follow certain ancestors if you'd like to, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, but if you have ancestors that you're following, then you can click on the following link and it's going to give you a whole listing of all those people that you follow. And you can click on any of those and it will bring you right to their page instead of having to look up your second great grandmother every time you can go to the ones that you're following find her in your following list it's a lot easier than searching through the family tree again 
And then the last one is called My Contributions. So that's going to show you people that you've added to Family Tree and any changes you've made to those people um, or any people, as well as some stats. So it's going to say, oh, you've added, you know, 20 new people this month or things like that. Um, you do, again, need to be logged into your Family Search account in order to view all of these, except for the overview button. Um, I mean, you can click on all of these, but it's going to prompt you to log into your Family Search account. And the Find button, you don't have to be logged in right away, but once you search a name in Find, like your second great grandmother, it's going to say, hey, you need to log in in order to view any further information. So if you're not already logged in, it's going to ask you to log in, which is why I tell you to create an account first before you go exploring a little more. Um, when you click on any of the options under Family Tree, you're also going to see a couple other options below then. Um, so I'm on a different page in the Family Tree, but I can see kind of all those options that we saw before are right at the top, plus an additional one called Recents. So if I click on Recents, it's going to bring me up kind of that list that we saw um, right off the home page, where again, it's going to have all these people I've recently worked on, and yourself is always going to be right at the top. Um, so clicking any of these names, it's going to bring you right into their individual page. So you can continue working on them because you've probably worked on them recently. Family Search is assuming you probably want to go back and, and work on them some more. And again, this is only going to show up if you are logged into your Family Search account. You can add your ancestor the, to the Family Search family tree if they aren't already added. Um, family Search is really awesome about trying to check for any duplicates before um, they add a new person, because of course we want to keep, you know, the tree as, you know, accurate as possible and not have, you know, somebody have five different pages if all of their, you know, grandchildren or great-grandchildren are adding all the same information. Uh, you want to double check any multiple spellings before you add um, someone so you aren't duplicating, but again, you can always merge those duplicates together if you do find a duplicate later. There are going to be several ways to add a new person. Um, the main two are going to be from the tree view or from a person view, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. So this is what the family tree view looks like. So because I want to keep my data private, I don't want you guys to know my birthday and my parents and all that stuff, I do have to give you a screenshot of this. But you can see this is where I am right here. This is where my parents are. These are where my grandparents are. If I would have added all of them, I've only added my one deceased grandpa. My other grandparents are still living, so I haven't added them at this point yet. And then I have my paternal great-grandparents um, right there. I did want to show you that anytime you want to add like a child of these um, groups of people, you can click on children and it's going to allow you to add child. But you can see right here, you know, I can add my paternal grandmother right there because it says add spouse. I can add the parents of my mother right there if I wanted to because it's an option right there. If I click on it, it's going to bring me to a page where I'd start filling in those details on those people. So that is from the tree view. You can also add people from a person view. So if you scroll down on a, on a person's page, which we'll show you a little bit more, um, all the different things you can click on later. But just to show you, this is how you add a person. Um, so you can add a child, a parent, a child, a spouse, a child with an unknown mother. So it really depends where in that family you are wanting to add somebody. So this page is on Peter still. This is my fourth great grandfather. So this is showing his wife, his children. So if I had wanted to add additional children or additional spouses, I do that here. These are his parents. So if I know that Peter has siblings, um, I can add an additional child. So it's going to be an additional child of his parents. So a brother or a sister of Peter. So be careful of where you're clicking and where um, and who you're adding details on, because this is where it can get a little tricky where you're, you know, adding somebody as a child, but they're really a brother or sister. So you want to make sure that you're clicking in that right spot. Um, if I wanted to, if I said, oh, these aren't the correct parents, I could add different parents, or maybe he had step parents or other things like that. Um, I could do that um, right from that page as well. And again, we'll dive a little deeper into the person view and all the things that you can see in person view um, in a second, but that's just quickly how you would add new people. And again, once you click on adding a child, adding a spouse, all that kind of stuff, it's going to bring up this page where you'd fill in that information. So you'd fill in their first name, last name, their sex, if they're deceased or if they're living, their birth date, death date, all that kind of stuff. And then 
it's going to check for a duplicate, like I said. So it's going to say, oh, right now there's no match found. So it appears like this is a completely new person that we can add to the family tree. So this is me adding my grandpa um, to the tree. So I would just click create person and now he'd be added to the tree. This is what it's going to look like if they do have a possible match found. So I went and did uh, a kind of creation of adding my great grandfather in there again. And it says, oh, it looks like we already have a match here. Here's his birth and death information, his spouse, his parents. Does it look like the same person um, to you? So you can kind of review that match. If it's the right person, it seems like all that information matches with what you have, then you can click on add a match. If it's not a match um, or you just want to create a new person, um, you would click that button right there. But of course, you'd only want to do that if it's not a correct match. So um, you can see what changes you have made to an ancestors page or what others um, have made changes to your ancestors if you follow a certain ancestor. So this is the top portion of what the family tree um, page looks like for a person. So this is uh, one of my ancestors. So right here in this yellow highlight is where you could click on follow. And I'll show you um, what that looks like a little um, better once we dive deeper into the, what the page looks like. But I just wanted to point out that Family Tree also gives you hints. It can connect you to records that have already been attached to your ancestors. So you can see there's 14 sources on this person. I could look through all those sources, see all the census records or other records that people have added on that ancestor. And you can also connect with others researching that same branch of the family, but you still, of course, want to verify everything, um, just like you would on any genealogy site. You want to verify anything that anybody's attaching or adding to your ancestors page because, you know, they might say, hey, this is the same name person. It's got to be the right person. It's got to be the same person, but not always. You got to do your due diligence and make sure it's the right person. But under that collaborate tape, um, tab, that's where you're going to be able to see other people who might have added comments or notes and things um, about this person who you can then click on um, who's adding that information, send them a message and, you know, discover, hey, this is my second cousin and they have these great family photos or they want to talk more about our, you know, branch of the family tree. So you can either also um, get, you know, sometimes photos of your ancestor or sometimes people will post obituaries or other stories um, that they've uploaded. So those are going to be in the memories tab. So you can see there's one memory on my ancestors tab um, and that's going to be the photo of her. So I, I have a great photo of her, thankfully. So if we click into her page, so I'm going to show you, it's going to make me sign in because I haven't signed in yet. So we're going to go ahead and sign in. And then we're gonna show you what that person page looks like for my ancestor. So you can see I'm following her. So anytime I would click on that following button, she's gonna appear in that list. But this is kind of the big overview um, part of the person page. There are multiple different tabs you can um, click on up here. Each of them are gonna show you a different view. So about is gonna kind of give you um, just a different way of looking at all the different things. So it's gonna kind of do a little computer generated life history of her. It's going to show you, oh, there's a photo of her or a memory of her. It's going to talk about spouses and children, parents and siblings over here. It's going to give a timeline. So all the kind of same stuff that you can find up here, it's going to kind of um, put them all together in this About tab. Here are where the sources are. And even down here, I can see what the, the name meaning is of her last name, of her middle name, um, possible related names. So if I can't think of other ways to spell Thompson, you know, these are you know, possible ways I would want to search for her name if it's maybe misspelled. Um, so earlier I mentioned everybody is assigned a special ID. So this would be her ID. If I wanted to um, use that for any reason, you know, I don't really keep these memorized or anything. It's just some easy way if you want to share information about your certain ancestor with somebody, perhaps you'd maybe want to give them that ID number because it's a little easier than saying, oh, it's the Emergency Thompson who was born this day and died that day. Um, you can just give them that quick little couple digit code and they can go to find and find that person by their ID number. So again, if we click under details, it's going to give us a little bit more information kind of that was under that about tab, but kind of displayed in a different way. So you can see your birth and death information. You can see what sources are attached to there. So anytime I would want to click on any of that information, I can click on it. It's going to bring me further in. 
up here is where it's going to give me some suggestions. So it's saying, oh, we think we found this record where she might be in. Um, she might have had more children. So there's evidence of a marriage, but no children are listed. There's a possible missing child because there's a gap. So it's kind of trying to help you think about your research and making sure you're kind of checking all those boxes on your ancestor. Scrolling further down, you can search the records directly from any of these sites and it kind of auto populates the information on that given ancestor on those sites. Of course, there's lots of sites here, though, that you do need to have a subscription to. Um, so you need to have a subscription in order to be able to do that search. Under this other information, it's going to give you some more information, like a lot of that census information on where she was living, um, other life events. Um, someone has put, you know, she was also known as M, um, so that might have been a nickname for her. Maybe they've seen other records with her where she's just referred to as M. Scrolling down, you can see there's a note. So um, somebody who's researching um, would have written this, that in the 1900 census, she claimed she had three living children out of five born. So now I know, oh, she for sure at that point had at least five children, um, but only three were living. Scrolling further down, this is where you'd see the family members. So like we showed a couple screens ago, this is where I could add a different, I could add a child if I know that these, this couple had a child. Um, it looks like she was married more than once. So you can see a spouse up here, a spouse down here. And then you'd click down here, you can see there's a number listed to the children. So you'd have to kind of click this arrow to get all those listed. Over here, you'd see her parents their marriage information, any siblings she would have. And again, anytime you'd wanna um, learn anything more about these people, you can kind of click on them and it's gonna give you a little kind of preview. And then to go deeper into that person, you'd click on their, their name and it's gonna bring you right into their profile. So again, every person kind of has their own little profile page. So scrolling back to where we were over here, you can see the latest changes. So you can see back in April, I added a source. You can see back in March, somebody had changed information on her burial. Um, again, somebody had also changed, looks like a volunteer project um, back in 2021 had changed some information on her burial as well. So I could, you know, click on this person and I could send them a message and say, hey, where did you get that burial information? Or, oh, are we cousins? Because you're researching the same person that's my second great grandmother or third great grandmother, um, whoever they are to you. And just send them a message and they might um, get back to you. And again, you can discover more on your ancestor. And then the final part is going to be the tools part. So you can see all these kind of things. This is where you would merge by those ID numbers. So say I find a second profile for Emerson C. Thompson, all the information seems to match, like it's the same person, I could merge those two duplicates together. Um, I can find, you know, possible duplicates. It's going to give me those sources. You can change your layout settings, all kinds of different things. Again, you know, we could spend a whole hour and a half just talking about the family tree, um, but I don't want to go too deep into all of this because we have a lot more to cover. Um, but you can see there's other spots for other relationships and a brief life history if somebody wanted to add that. The next tabs, those are going to be the sources. So again, this is where you'd want to check to see um, what information other people have added. So you can see there's a bunch of census records, there's marriage records. Anytime I'd want to look at this, I could just click on it. It's going to give me a little indexed kind of snapshot of it first. And then if I wanted to click in more to it, I'd click on that link and it's going to pull up that record page. So I can see She's listed here as the bride. So this is her, her first marriage to John Butler. I can see the information here. Unfortunately, up here it says the image is unavailable. So I'd have to, you know, see where else I could find that image to follow up and get that actual marriage record if I don't already have it. So I could go back to these sources. I can see who's added it and I can, again, click on their name. I can send them a message and say, hey, we have the same ancestor. How are you related? And reach out and hopefully get a response from them. You're going to see a couple different symbols um, with each of these sources. And I have a screen in a second that talks about what each of those symbols or um, kind of icons mean and how to differentiate them. Just quickly, I want to show you the collaborate. So again, this is where people could add certain notes or there could be a discussion. So somebody um, has added some information about this middle name possibly being Ramsey, but you know, it seems like they maybe are just pushing together her nickname of Emma or M and Ramsey and maybe misspelling Emerency. 
And then again, the memories tab, that's where you could find potential photos of your ancestor. Like I said, people have added obituaries or have type stories, things like that. Um, so you could click on that and I can click on the image to get um, a more fuller snapshot of it. And I can see, you know, information that this person has added. Again, who has added it? I could um, even save this photo. I can zoom in, zoom out, do whatever I want to. I can share it um, with other people. I can, if you go under actions, that's where you would download that photo. So it's kind of cool to be able to see those photos of your ancestors. So that's essentially um, family tree, or at least kind of what we're going to cover. Um, again, there's one more tab here um, that's going to be that timeline, but it's kind of cool where you can kind of click on the different things and it's going to show you on a map um, where that happened. Um, so it's saying she was married in Wisconsin. It doesn't give an exact location at that um, one, but you can see if I click on this one, it's going to give exact location of Bovina in Outagamey County, which is where Appleton is, or not too far from Appleton. I can see where Bovina is on the map. Um, if I wanted to, I could zoom out a little bit and see, oh, look at here's Appleton. So this is up here is where they were born. Well, that's not too far from Appleton if I want to go there and explore a little bit more where that person was born. So again, here are what those different icons mean on those family tree sources. So if you see the kind of looking like a, a little tree, that's going to be um, any record that exists in Family Search. So those are going to be records that you can find on Family Search. If you find one that has a little globe on it, that means it's an outside of Family Search um, source. So like something like Fold Three or Fold Three or Find a Grave. You know, I see a lot of those attached to um, people's um, profiles on Family Tree or those memory sources. So photos, stories, documents, audio files, audio files, those are all um, other potential sources. So those are what those icons mean. So we kind of did a little demo of what it looked like um, when you look at a person, but how did I go about finding that person? That's what I'm going to show you now. So again, this is what it looks like when I sign into Family Search. So this is my home page. I'm going to click on Family Tree. I'm going to click on find because I want to find my ancestors. And then again, you can search by name or you can search by ID. So say maybe my cousin sent me that ID of a person that they want me to look at. I can put that format in, in that um, seven digit ID. Or if I don't know, again, who I'm looking for, or I'm just looking for any of my ancestors, I can start typing in their information. So I'm going to try to find my third great grandfather, Jacob Stilp. Um, if I wanted to, I could put any kind of place or year here, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to click more options first, because then it's going to give me some more options where I could either click in on his birth, his marriage, a place where he would have lived, or his death information. So I'm going to put in his death information. I know he died in Menasha, Wisconsin. So I'm going to select that. And I know he died in 1907, so I'm going to put that in there to narrow it down from any other potential Jacob Stilps there might be. I can add other information if I want to, or I can just keep it like this. Um, it really depends. Um, but for now, I'm just going to leave it pretty vague and just his name and death information and click search. And now it's going to give me a potential listing of all the different Jacob Stilps in the family tree. So I can kind of get a little snapshot of um, a birth date, a death date, parents, and a spouse, and I can see which one makes sense for my ancestor and what kind of matches what I might already know about them. Well, I know my third great-grandfather died in 1907 in Menasha, Wisconsin, and I know that these are his parents and that's his wife from my research, so I know that this is for sure my third great grandfather. So I can again click on his name. It's going to again kind of give you that little snapshot again. And if I click on his name again, it's going to bring me right into that kind of overview page where I can, you know, go explore more. I can see all that stuff that we just looked at before. Um, I can add more people. I can, you know, oh, look at I see there's no marriage event for him. Well, if there's anything I decide I want to change or I want to add, anytime you find that pencil icon, that's what you can do. So I do happen to know when Jacob and Maggie were married, so I'm going to click on that pencil icon, and I can click on Add Event. So this is their marriage. I want to make sure it's selected. I know the date of their marriage is going to be the 18th of May in 1854. 
you want to make sure you always click that so it standardizes the, the place because sometimes people might type in May 18th, 1854, or you know they might put you know instead of May they might type 05 for the month. So you always want to make sure you're having a standardized place and a standardized date. So the place they were actually married in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I'm going to start typing that. And I know it's the city of Milwaukee, so you want to make sure you're selecting the city instead of the county, unless all you know is the county. And then in this last box, this is the really important part. This is the reason why you think or know this information is correct. Um, so I actually got an email earlier today about somebody who's attending the session, um, and she asked, well, how do I deal with all this incorrect information? Well, this is a spot where you can help kind of alleviate some of the incorrect information by putting in your source for incorrect or for correct information. So for example, I know that thanks to his obituary, so I'm going to put in Jacob Stilp's obituary from the Daily Northwestern. Of course, I can't type very well today in Oshkosh, Wisconsin on 31st of August, 1907, page 15, lists his spouse and marriage date. So I'm going to put that kind of as my reasoning so that anybody who sees that I've added this information, they're going to see that reasoning and say, oh, that must be correct. Then um, I can also add in here, I have searched for the vital record at Wisconsin Historical Society and it does not exist because Wisconsin did not require marriage records until 1907 so I would have been lucky to find one in 1854. So now anybody who sees this if, after I hit save, um, anybody who's following these ancestors would get notification that I made that change and they'd be able to see my reasoning behind that. So again, you can add any information here. If I wanted to, I could add that source that is tied to his marriage. I don't want to bore you with all the little details and take up too much of your time. Um, so later I'm going to do that. But that's quickly how you might edit something in anybody's family search, uh, family tree page. So now I can see up here under the latest changes that today I added that event. If I clicked on show details, it's going to show other things that, um, so again, there's that reasoning, what I've changed, who's changed it, what date. You can see um, earlier this month I deleted a relationship because it's not the mother for this person. Somebody else had added that information. Um, I could have maybe had a little bit more detail in there, but um, you know, I was in a rush, so that's just quickly what it looks like. And again, if this was somebody else, I could click on it. I could um, send them a message and say, hey, why did you change this information? I know that's not correct or something like that. So that's, um, again, the family tree and how to find somebody, how to change things, how to add people. Um, unfortunately, we can't dive any more deeper just because we have so much more yet to cover yet tonight. If you do have any questions um, more about the family tree, feel free to type those into the Q&A box and I will answer those questions at the end for you. Uh, there is also a great resource on the Family Search website where you can get the basics of using the family tree. Um, so again, this is a link in your handout for you um, where you can learn a little bit more about using that family tree if you haven't yet explored that part of the site. Um, also, I want to just quick give you my personal advice. So um, again, earlier somebody had emailed me and said, well, what do I do with all this incorrect information and all these people are changing stuff on my family tree? Well, I personally, I say keep your tree somewhere else where only you can edit it, but don't be afraid to add or modify things on the family search family tree. Yes, anybody can change or edit what you're adding, um, but if you're making sure that you're adding sources when you're adding those facts, or at the very least, you know, adding that reasoning behind the changes, somebody, you know, hopefully won't go behind you and undo those changes, but, you know, you can't control what other people are going to do. Um, I have an example. My um, third great-grandparents, August and Amelia Kebschel, um, I thought, hey, these are some pretty unique people. Those are going to be pretty unique names, and as I've researched them the last um, 18 years, I found out, you know, how many kids they have and all this kind of information. Every time I go into their profiles on Family Search, I've seen more kids added to them, and that's because um, August and Amelia are not the only August and Amelia Kepschel in the world. So there was another August and Amelia Kepschel 
oddly enough, that were also living in Chicago at the same time that they were. And they also happened to have two children that were named, one was named Fred and one was named Dora, just like my August and Amelia. So all the time I go into Family Search Family Tree and I look these, my August and Amelia up and these other additional kids that I know are the other August and Amelia capsule um, are added to the Family Search Family Tree. And I keep untangling them and then somebody else goes right behind me and adds those additional kids again, no matter how many times I add my reasoning, all my sources, all that stuff. People keep trying to merge these two unrelated families together just because they have the same name. So unfortunately, that's one um, downfall of the family tree. But again, anytime you find any information on family tree, you want to go and do your own research. You want to make sure to back up what you're finding on there. Don't just believe everything that everybody has on there, even if they have it properly sourced. You need to go through, double check it yourself, make sure it matches up with what you know about your family, and you're not just merging people with the same name together um, and trying to make these puzzle pieces fit that might not quite fit. Um, so that's my two cents, take it or leave it. But, you know, personally for me, I don't spend a whole ton of time on Family Tree adding and editing a bunch of stuff because I want to do my own research and make sure my research is something that other people can't edit. Um, but I will, you know, add and edit things that I know are incorrect um, or that people haven't discovered yet about my direct ancestors when I have time. So now we're going to move on to searching. So again, the main thing that Family Search is known for, of course, are their historical records. So there are going to be two main ways you can search, um, depending on what you're searching for. The first one that we're going to talk about is the main way to search under the index records. So if you click on the search tab, you're going to get all these different options. And we're going to um, talk about these more in depth in this uh, a few minutes, um, but if you click on records, that's where you're going to be able to search those index records. If you click under images, that's where you're going to be able to search those unindexed. And again, I'll do a little demo and dive deeper in a minute. And then the other things you might want to search are going to be the family tree, genealogies, catalog, books, and the research wiki. So we did, of course, just cover that family tree. This is another way that you could go to search the family tree instead of going to family tree and find. So if you click on that records tab, which is that first option under search, there's even three different ways you can search on this page. So I'll quickly go through those before I show you um, what it looks like a little bit more in depth. So the first one is kind of this main search box where you can put in your ancestors' names, you can put in information on a place or a year for a certain life event. Um, so this isn't specifying any certain life event when you first click on it, but if you click on that more options, that's where, um, like we saw when we searched in the family tree, that's where you can put in those certain details tailored to your search. So I can put in that death information, or I can put in that birth information, or that spouse. Um, but you, again, want to tailor your search to what you're searching for. So if you're going to be searching for a birth record for your ancestor, you don't want to put in your marriage and death information, because that information is not going to be on their birth record. You want to put in, you know, maybe their parents' names, um, or maybe an approximate birth year or location for that person. Or you could even just start your search with a name, depending on how common of a name your ancestor is. But again, the more details you put in there, the kind of narrower it's going to make your search. So, and anytime you search something, you want to search something multiple different ways to see what other results you get. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes, but um, this is how you would do kind of the main search from the search box. The second way, if you scroll a little bit down on that records page, is going to be searching through a, find a collection. So this is going to be by collection name. There are over 3,200 collections on Family Search alone. So what you would do is you would start typing a place or a genealogy record type. So I could type in Wisconsin birth, for example, or I could just type in Wisconsin, and it's going to start pulling collections that are related to Wisconsin for me. You could even put in a specific county or a specific country, um, but again, it's going to depict depend on what the collection name is. So if I type in Outagamey for Outagamey County, Wisconsin, where Appleton is, I get a record collection called Wisconsin Outagamey County Records from 1825 to 1980. Well, that sounds like a really great collection, but don't stop there because that's not everything on Outagamey County, Wisconsin. Things could be under Wisconsin only or under national collections, so United States Census. So 
Outagamie County is included in all of those records. So if you just stopped at that one collection, you'd be missing a ton more information. Um, so that's why, um, you know, Family Search does have multiple ways to search for things and um, searching it kind of how you want to search it essentially. Then that third option under this historic records part is going to be searching by place. So this is where you put in the country, like Germany or the province. So if it's a Canadian province, for example, or a state, so you could put in Wisconsin, Illinois, whatever state. Um, you don't want to put in a county or a city level here, though. Um, again, um, these are kind of more the higher level place location. Um, it's going to bring you to what they call a learning center for that location, and I'll show you what that looks like. It's a really cool area where you can learn additional information on researching in that location. So say it's your first time researching in Wisconsin records. Well, this might be a great spot for you to learn a little bit more about researching in Wisconsin before you dive deeper into trying to find your ancestors. Also at the top of the location page is where you can search in the index collections just for that location. So if I just want to search in Wisconsin records for my ancestor, I could, you know, drill down into the Wisconsin only ones through here and then search right through there just in those Wisconsin collections. Or if I scroll down even further, I can search in genealogies or those image only unindexed collections and see different catalog materials just for that location. And again, I'll show you a demonstration in a second of what that all looks like. So first, we're going to search in the historic um, records by a name. And before we go in there, though, I do want to point out this really awesome tips for effective searches. We don't have time to dive into effective searching tonight because we have so much to cover. Um, but if you haven't um, done a whole lot of searching on Family Search, or even if you have, I definitely encourage you to read through that quickly um, later when you got some time, because it gives you some really great tips and tricks on how to search and use the site most effectively. And there is a link um, for that in your handout as well. So again, this is what it looks like when I first sign into Family Search. If I want to go to that search tab and click on records, that's what we were just talking about. So again, you can see that main search box. Here's the find a collection. There's the search by place. Here's that tips for effective searches, or you can click on all that stuff. But first, I'm going to search for my ancestor. So again, we're going to pull up Jacob Stilp. And again, I could put in any random place or year if I wanted to, but I want to click on more options because I want to tailor my search a little bit more. And so again, I'd put in his death information I know is Menasha, Wisconsin. And again, you'd want to click on where it gives you that county listing too, so it makes sure you're selecting the right Menasha, Wisconsin, if there's more than one, but there isn't. And then um, you could also put in a year range. So maybe if you're not completely sure of what the year is or you have a, a range, you could do that. But I know for sure that mine died in 1907. So I'm just going to do 1907 for both. Again, I could add additional information if I wanted to. Um, again, depending on what I'm searching for, but say I'm searching for some death information on him. Uh, that's all I want to put in for now. So I'm going to click on search when I'm done putting in what I want to put in. And it's going to give me this results page. So now I can see all these different things. Um, I can narrow it down by any of these options up here if I wanted to. So say, well, I know Jacob is a man, so I can filter it by sex and I can put male only and I can click apply and then it's going to narrow out any of those that might be related to females. Um, I want to, you know, encourage you to do both of, you know, looking through all the results or narrowing it down because you never know though, sometimes they might kind of index things a little incorrectly, or maybe I would randomly find a record related to his spouse under here. And maybe if filtering out the sex to male only, you know, I would miss that record or stumbling across, you know, things I wasn't expecting to find. Um, you could also change preferences and all that fun stuff or narrow it down even further if you want to. Um, but for this, you know, we only have 76 results, so I'm not going to go too crazy into filtering things. But, you know, sometimes if you get thousands and thousands of results, you definitely want to filter it um, a, at least a little bit or maybe add some additional details. If I wanted to revise my search, I could do that over here. So when I see a result that looks interesting to me, um, I can click on his name. 
And that's going to bring me to kind of that index page where it's going to give me a little brief snapshot of this record. So it's going to tell me, oh, this is a find a grave index. Here's some death information, some birth information, some burial information. There's a photograph included, but I can see in order to view any further details, it's going to be on find a grave. So if I want to click on it, it's going to say, okay, are you sure you want to go to find a grave and leave family search? Um, so if I wanted to, I could click on go to find a grave and be brought out there. But for now, I'm going to go back to my search results. So if I just click that back button, it'll bring me right back to my search results and I can click on the next thing. There's also a bunch of different icons over here and I'll tell you um, right now what all of those different icons mean. So you're going to see these common icons. So there's going to be the person outline that is going to bring um, potential uh, tree matches for that person. So if I clicked on him, it would probably pop up with that um, family search family tree page that we looked at before for him. If you see the camera with a page behind, that means it's hosted on another website. So like we just saw, find a grave, that means it's a website outside of family search. So it's going to ask you before it wants, before it will bring you to that site to make sure you're, you're wanting to leave family search. If you see just the paper with the kind of lines on it, that's going to be where you can view those record details. So if you see that icon and no camera icon with it, that means it's only an index. So there's no, you know, actual record image with that. It's just an index. Just give me some of those details. If I see that camera icon like we see right here in the middle, that means that I can view that image right on Family Search. So it's going to bring you directly to that image if you click on that camera icon and not going to it's not going to give you that record overview or that index. So say it's a census record, I can click on that camera and be bright, right, right, brought right back right into that census record. And then this other icon you might see is kind of like a pedigree looking thing. So that means that this record was attached to a person in the family tree. And if I click on it, it's going to bring me into that family tree page for that person um, so I could look at that further. Um, so just be aware of what these icons mean before you click on them. And again, if you go to that results page, you can always click on the person's name and it's going to bring you um, some more details um, before, you know, you want to decide to click on any of those things to bring you outside of the search results. Now quickly we're going to do a little demonstration of how to use that find a collection and search by place options. So again this is what it looks like when I first sign into Family Search. I'm going to go back to that search and that records tab. Instead of typing in right here to find my ancestor by name, I'm going to scroll down. So I see find a collection. Again, this is where you're going to type in either a place or a record type or both. So I can type in Wisconsin marriages. And now I can see, oh, there's actually three different marriage collections on Wisconsin. So depending on, you know, what person I'm looking for, what date range I'm looking for, you know, decides which one I'm going to click on. So say I want to click on this one from 1836 to 1930. I can click on it and then I can do that name search, but it's going to only search just in this collection if I wanted to. So for example, I could click in and just type in Stilp and click search and see what I get. And so again, now I'm going to see the, that results page just like I saw before, um, but this is going to be narrowed just down to that one collection. But there's still 271 results of Stilps being married in Wisconsin during this time period. So again, I could click on that person to be brought into that page for some more detail. So this is an index and I can see some more information that I might be able to decide if it's my ancestor or not. If I click the back button, it's going to bring me back to those results. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out though on here is this how to use a collection part. Um, so if you've never used this collection before, and before you start that search, I want you to click on this because this is such a helpful little thing. And I think almost all, if not all of the collections have that helpful little button. So it will bring you to a little Wikipedia page about this collection. So first it's going to tell me it's a legacy collection, so that means they're not adding additional records to it. They're not making any corrections, anything like that. That's what a legacy collection means. But now I can see all these different things I can click into, or I can just, you know, scroll through the entirety of this and learn about um, what, if the images are available to be viewed, what might the records be able to tell me? I can look at a coverage table. So right here I can see, oh, you know, there's a link to click. Anything you see that's blue, you can click in. 
And now I can see, hey, look at there's births and christenings, there's marriages, there's deaths and burials that are related to Wisconsin. But say I was looking in that 1836 to 1930 marriage collections, if I'm looking for somebody in Buffalo County, there's no marriages in this collection. So if my ancestors were married in Buffalo County during this time period, I'd want to know that before even trying to do a search in that marriage um, collection because I'm essentially wasting my time if I know that they were married in Buffalo County because for whatever reason they don't have any Buffalo County records in that collection. I can always go back to that main kind of how to use the collection thing and it's going to again show me how to search the collection. It's going to tell me how do I analyze the results. It's going to it brings you to a what do I do next? If you find the person you're looking for, what do you do? If you can't find the person you're looking for, what do you do? Um, there's also other links that you can click on for more additional guided research help, um, different tips and strategies um, related to this collection. So again, there's all kinds of really great information in here that if you just take a minute to just skim through it quick, you learn a little bit more about that collection before you start diving deeper and trying to search your ancestors. So again, we're going to go back to that search records tab and now I'm going to search by place. So I'm going to show you what that looks like over here. So again, just the same kind of steps we did before. This time I am going to search by Germany. So again, you can type in a country, a province, or a state. So it tells you that right there. Again, you don't want to put in county or city level. But this is essentially going to give you a whole Germany overview. So I can either click right here right away to learn a little bit more and go to the Family Search Wiki that will tell me a little bit more about researching in Germany, which I'll show you a little bit more in depth in a minute when we talk about the wiki. But if I scroll down, again, this is where I could search in those index-only collections, or I could click in just one of these collections instead of searching all 45 German collections. Maybe I just want to do the deaths and burial one. Um, I can look at this learning center. So those actually 51 learning courses to help me learn a little bit more about doing genealogy research in Germany. So I can see there's one on German census records. There's historical geography geography. There's um, all about Hansen's map guide. So if you click on this see all, it's going to bring you all of those different um, video things that they have, or sometimes they have handouts, things like that. You know, sometimes they're rather lengthy, sometimes they're short. Um, so if you are not familiar with researching in an area, this is a really great spot to learn more before you start trying to dive into finding your ancestors in those records. If we scroll down a little further, this is where I can search in the genealogies just again for this location. Um, so if I know for sure my ancestors were in Germany, I can type in their names here and see um, what collections I might be able to find them in specifically in that location just related to genealogies. Over here on the left, it's going to show you any potential indexing projects. So again, later tonight, we're going to um, show you just briefly what indexing looks like and what that means and how you might be able to contribute. And then further down, you're going to see the image only historical collections. So again, these are things that are not indexed. If I knew my ancestor was in um, Stebach, Germany, and was potentially in a church book extract from 1675 to 1951, I might want to click on this. And again, I'd want to click on that, how to use the collection first to learn a little bit more. But then I'd want to browse through these images and see, okay, um, I know these are births, marriages, and deaths. Great. And that's awesome if my ancestor was living in this area. Well, unfortunately, darn, I have to be at a family search center or an affiliate library to access that. So since I'm from home, I can't do that right now. Um, but if I wasn't from home, I could, um, you know, look at that, um, you know, at home if it was available from home. Or I can add this to my source box for later when I go to the family search center or when I'm at an affiliate library. If I go back again to that Germany location page, again, I can scroll down some more. I can see all the different catalog materials. So these are different catalog records that they have related to Germany that might be books, it might be microfilm, it might be, um, you know, digital records, all kinds of things. They have 37,000 results just related to Germany. And I can even narrow it down by a record type. So say I'm looking only for, um, you know, military records in Germany. Now I just have 1,200 catalog records um, related to military records in Germany. So this is another spot, again, where you can do location-specific uh, research. 
All right, again, I just want to point out, look for search tips on several pages of FamilySearch. Read through those tips, help you learn how to use those sites or those collections more effectively. And again, many collections have that how to use a collection button and be sure to read those before. Um, just quickly, a little tip about searching. So I want, again, to tell you to search multiple different ways. Every time you change your search criteria when you're searching, it's going to give you a different result. So maybe for the first time you search, you just put your ancestor's first name and your last name. Then, you know, you go through those results, you see what things might be relevant to that person. Then you're going to go back into the search again. You're going to maybe put in that first name and last name, but then add a birth year, plus or minus five years, and maybe a birth location to the state level. Then you're going to go through those results again and see if there's anything new that you didn't find in that first go around. And again, then you're going to go back to that search after you've looked at those new records. The third search, you're going to maybe just do the last name plus that birth location. And every time you're going to modify that search criteria, you might get some of the same results, but you also might get different results. And that might be the difference in finding that, you know, brick wall breaking record that you've been looking for because, you know, maybe for whatever reason, the index didn't pull some information or maybe the information is just a little bit off of what you thought it was. So those results, for whatever reason, weren't popping up in those other searches. So, you know, you can always start broad with your search. Use those filters like I showed you at the top when we looked at those results, if you have too many results to go through. So again, those filters are the things at the top where you can narrow it down by like sex or by location or, um, you know, date, things like, things like that. Um, if a search doesn't work, research. You know, that's why they call it research. So always be sure to, to modify your search. Don't just give up after you search a name and say, oh, they must not have anything on my ancestor. Nope. You got to try a different search with different criteria. Um, you know, there's going to be tons of great tips to search for records that are indexed, of course. So again, by, you know, typing in information, I get a results page of all this great stuff that's indexed. But what about all those records that aren't indexed? Because there's got to be tons of them that aren't indexed on family search. Well, now we're going to dive into those. So that next tab under search is going to be the images tab. So that's where all those unindexed records live. So if you've never clicked on that images tab, you are missing a ton of great stuff. There are over 5 billion, yes, billion with a B, records and counting that are unindexed. So unindexed means you won't be able to find them doing a name search for your ancestor. So again, this is under the search and then clicking on images. Um, you can f also find it in that locations tab. So like we just looked at, if you go through that search by place icon option, um, so we search by Germany and then we saw if we scroll down, there's that image only historical record. So that's another way you can get to it instead of going through the images tab. Um, but if when you are doing this um, unindexed collections, you are wanting to search by location where your ancestor lives. So if you know your second great grandparents lived in Peoria County, Illinois, that's where you want to start. You don't want to put in your ancestor's name because it's not going to give you anything. That's not indexed. And just be aware that sometimes you can actually even narrow down further to a specific city um, in that county or in that state um, or even in that country. So search, again, multiple different ways. The downfall of this unindexed collections, though, is that you're going to have to search through the collections image by image. But first, before you dive into doing that, I want you to look and see if there's a table of contents in that film. So sometimes at the beginning of the film, there might be some sort of index or table of contents that will tell you a little bit about what's to come in that film. Maybe there's an index at the end or some sort of alphabetical listing that it index, you know, might be in the original film and the original records, but it's not yet searchable on Family Search. So even if you tried doing a search for it, you'd never find it. This is the only place it lives for right now until somebody is able to index that record. And again, there's five billions of five billion unindexed records. So it's going to take a really long time before all this stuff gets indexed. So if you are just completely ignoring this part of the site, you are missing a ton of gold on your ancestor. Um, another easy way to maybe potentially identify how images are organized and try to find your ancestor a little easier is um, looking at an example like this. So say you had a set of marriage records that contains 1,874 images of in unindexed collection. 
and it covers the year of 1840 to 1898. Well, you can see that the images are going to be in chronological order. So it starts with 1840, goes to 1841, 1842, etc., etc. Well, if you know your ancestor was married in 1870, that's approximately about halfway between 1840 and 1898. So maybe what's half of 1874? That's, you know, 937 or so. Well, you can type that image number in there and see how close you are to that marriage record from 1870. Then you can kind of go back and forth between those image groups um, until you find one that seems close to, to 1870. You know, if 937 isn't very close, if it's at 1856, well, then you know you need to go a little bit further. So maybe type in 1250 and see, okay, am I at 1870? Am I at 1869? Am I at 1872? What year am I at? And keep kind of doing that until you get close to that 1869, 1870 time. And then once you get closer to where you want to be, then that's when you use those arrows to go back and forth between those different images. And that'll help you go through them a little quicker than going one by one by one of all of those 1874 images. So hopefully that's a little tip that'll save you a little bit of time to go through those collections a little faster. So now I'm going to show you really quickly um, what it looks like um, to search the unindexed records. Um, be aware there is, um, you know, some different screens depending on if you have the new version or not of this um, screen or not. So this is what it might look like for you or it might look a little bit different. So if you click on try new version, um, I'm going to show you what it looks like. So this is what it looks like for me because I'm at the new version. But if I wanted to return to the old version, it's going to look just like that, where it says explore historical images. Again, if you were randomly just signed into Family Search and you wanted to remember how do I get there again, it's going to be under search and images. And again, this is being recorded. So if I'm going a little too fast for you, you can always rewind when you get the recording. Again, I want you to come to that how to get started if you've never used this section of the site. Um, you can learn a little bit more about things down here, um, but of course we got to move a little quickly because we've already been here for an hour and 20 minutes and we still got a lot more to cover. So I'm going to type in out of Gamey County, Wisconsin. I'm going to click on it and I'm going to click search. Again, there's an option to click more options if you want to, but right now we're just going to do a basic search on just this location. And so now I can see there's a bunch of different record collections. It tells me how many images over here. If I scroll over, it might give me some more details. So maybe these are one of my ancestors um, that for whatever reason, they kind of have it indexed-ish um, by the volume. So I might be able to just quickly tell, hey, that's not my ancestor. Hey, it's, it is. Um, but there's some records that they're just not indexed like that. Again, like I mentioned before, sometimes you can narrow it down by a specific place. So if I wanted to look at Appleton or Grand Chute or any of these other smaller communities in Outagamie County, I could. Um, so for example, if I want to click on Grand Chute, I can see, oh, there's census records, there's diaries, genealogical tables, miscellaneous records, et cetera, et cetera. There's 210 images of it. So cool. Um, if I want to explore that, I just click on where it says image group number in blue, and it's going to bring me into those 200 and some images. So now I can see, you know, I can kind of see a quick overview of what it might look like. I can click in on any page I want to, explore it a little bit more, zoom in, zoom out, all that fun stuff. Right here, I can download it, zoom in, zoom out. Again, all this fun stuff. I can attach it to my source box. I can attach it to a tree if I want to attach it to a certain person, for example. Um, so there's so much stuff you can do in here. Again, we can't take the time, unfortunately, to explore it all, but this is how you would find that unindexed great stuff that might be related to your ancestors in a given location. So don't miss that part of this, the site. All right, moving on, like I showed you before, the same spot where you would click on family tree and find is going to be that same exact thing. If you click search in family tree, it's going to pop up what we looked at before where you can find by name or find by ID. So we're going to skip that since we already covered it essentially. And we're going to move down to the genealogies section. So again, this is under search and genealogies. 
So these are large directories of genealogies that have been submitted to FamilySearch. They've been submitted by different people or different organizations throughout the years. If you've been a long time user of FamilySearch, this is the area where they house what they have called the ancestral file, the international genealogical index, and the pedigree resource file. So these are long time um, record sets that people used to be able to contribute to, um, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago um, when FamilySearch, you know, was doing things like that. Um, you can, of course, see FamilySearch for further details on all these different genealogy collections. Um, many of them are older collections. They are now closed to new submissions, so that means you can't submit your own thing um, to the International Genealogical Index, for example. The one thing that you can submit your own GEDCOM to, and GEDCOM, if you're not familiar with that, is a computer genealogy file that you can download of your family tree data, either from your genealogy software or Ancestry.com or any other genealogy website you might use to build your tree in. So if you wanted to, you could submit your own GEDCOM to the pedigree resource file. And again, you need to, you know, look into family search and read a little bit more about that and what that all entails, because again, we can't just spend all this time looking at every little detail tonight or we'd be here all night. The great thing about the genealogy section in FamilySearch is that they're grouped by what they are. So you can read each description, note um, that FamilySearch even lists a data accuracy value to each collection. So it says high data accuracy or unknown data accuracy or low data accuracy. So it's kind of telling you, like we think this stuff's pretty accurate or not, um, but regardless of if it says high data accuracy or not, you still want to go through, find the actual records, find the actual proof to confirm any information that you're going to find in these genealogies, because that's just what a good genealogist would do. You don't want to just, you know, accept all this information as the truth without doing your own research and confirming it. So I'll do a quick demo of how to search in that genealogies part in Family Search. So again, to get there from the home page, you'd click on um, search and click on genealogies, and that's going to bring you right to where I started. So here you could put in first name, last name. Again, just like we have with other searches, you could click more options if you wanted to. I'm just going to pop in the name of my fourth great grandfather, Peter Stope, and click search. So now I can see, oh, there's an ancestral file. Um, there's one that kind of looks like Peter Stilp, but it's got a John in front of it. So that might not be my person. So over here, again, you can kind of see that preview to see, okay, is this my ancestor? Does it match with what I'm looking for? All that kind of stuff before you click into it and explore more. So once you find one that looks like, you know, it might be something you want to explore, you just click on where it says that name. And a lot of them look kind of like that family search family tree that we looked at before. But this is, again, data that's already been submitted by other people. If you click on show more detail, it might tell you, oh, this was submitted by so-and-so. There's 5,200 people in it. And I can click on this guy's name. I can add him as a contact. Um, unfortunately, from here, I can't message him. You know, maybe he doesn't have a family search account anymore or for whatever reason, you know, family search hasn't linked it. So I can't send him an email, unfortunately. But I can look through his information. I can see if it matches what I have. Um, I could maybe use it as a hint. You know, maybe if I didn't know that that was his death date, maybe I could know now go and explore and see if I'm able to find some sort of proof to confirm that information. And again, just like the family search family tree, you can kind of play around and go down, down, down. It looks like this is only following a direct line. It's not giving any siblings or additional children or anything like that. But I can click on, you know, the different people and it's going to give me that information that this person submitted over here. So again, you can play with this as much as you want and again, um, confirm anything that you would want to find in there. And then just quickly on that genealogies part, I wanted to show you if you scroll down, this is where it tells you that high data accuracy. It tells you what these certain collections are. If you just wanted to search in those certain collections, you could do that from there. Um, again, there's all these different ones. Or if you just wanted to search in them all, that's where you would search this part up here like we did in our example. All right, moving on. Next, we're going to the catalog. So catalogs just aren't for libraries. Of course, I'm a librarian. Of course, I'm going to tell you to use the catalog. But even if I wasn't a librarian, I would tell you, please use the catalog because it is awesome. So the catalog is going to show you all the genealogical materials, including books, online materials, microfilm, microfiche, different publications. It includes materials that are available online. It includes materials that are at that Family Search Center or that Family Search Library in Salt Lake City. 
and at the Family Search Centers worldwide. Um, if you do only want to look at things that are, that are online, you do have that option to click that under availability. Just so you're aware, if you're like, hey, I'm never going to go to Salt Lake City or I'm never going to go to the Family Search Center and I just want to look at what's online, that's, that's an option in the catalog as well. So again, that's right here under availability if you see this little screenshot of what the catalog looks like. So in the catalog, you can search multiple different ways. You can search by a place name, so a location like Wisconsin I did in this example. Um, you could search by a title, if you know like a title of a book or something. You could search by a surname, so your own surname or a surname of an ancestor, or if you know a certain author or something that authored a book that you're looking for related to genealogy, you could search it here. Um, you could also search it under author or subject or keyword or call number or film or fiche number. So lots of different ways to search in the catalog. You can even search by more than one of these. So, um, you know, in this example, I put Wisconsin for the place and I put a surname of Johnson so that I'm searching for all the Johnsons in Wisconsin, for example. But just be aware, the more information you put in all these fields, the more it's going to narrow down your search. And it might not give you any results. If you have, you know, all of these fields filled in, that's, you know, going to be pretty rare to find um, something with all of that information, but you never know. So again, just like we did with the searches before, play with that search criteria, see what kind of results you get, um, you know, start with a little data or add a little bit more if you're not getting the results that you think you should be getting. So I'll show you a quick demo here. Um, this is always a really great spot where you can, you know, find what given things are available for a certain place for, for where your ancestors lived. Um, so for example, I'm going to put in Appleton right here. I want to see all the cool Appleton things. So if I start typing Appleton, I can see there's actually an Appleton in England. That's pretty cool. There's multiple different Appletons in England. There's one in Canada. There's one in Colorado. There's one in Maine. There's one in Minnesota. I knew the Minnesota one because we get the phone calls sometimes for them. But I definitely want this one in Wisconsin because that's where I am. So I want to make sure I'm click clicking the right one. And then again, I can narrow down to what's online or what's at the Family Search Center, or I can type in anything else if I want to, or I could just leave it just as the place if I want to. Now I'm going to see all these different kind of um, types that it might be under. So if I'm looking specifically for church records, for example, I can see there's three different results. If I click on that arrow, it's going to give me those results. So now I can see, hey, they have something related to baptisms and marriage records at the First, First United Methodist Church in Appleton. And maybe that's the church that my ancestors went to. So let me click on it. And now I'm going to be brought into a catalog view for this record. So now I can read a little bit more about it. I can see how big it is or how many pages it is. I can see what the call number is. I can see it's a book. Um, I can read the notes to see a little bit more details. You know, sometimes they're really detailed records. Sometimes they aren't. I can see, oh, look at darn, it's at that Family Search um, Library or the Family History Library. So that means I have to go all the way to Salt Lake City. I can see a little icon that says, oh, it's a microfilm. If you kind of hover over it, it tells you, oh, this is the microfilm at the Family Search Center. So it might be at a Family Search Center locally in Appleton. Um, but, you know, unfortunately for me, it's not available online. But I can go back to those search results and I can explore a little bit more. Um, so say maybe now I want to look at the school yearbooks. I want to see, oh, look at, you know, they have a couple different yearbooks, one for Lawrence University, one for Appleton High School. Cool. You know, let me click on the Clarion if I, that's what I wanted to look at. Maybe that's where my ancestor went to school. And I can see, oh, there's actually multiple different years. You know, maybe one of these years is the one my ancestor is in. Maybe it's online. So I can click on it and look at anytime there's a digital version of it, it's going to tell you right in bright red. There's a digital version of this. So be sure to click here. And now this brings me into the digital version of it. So again, I can look, see how many pages it is. I can view inside. I could browse this. I could even do a little search if I wanted to click search. You know, I could see, hey, is my Smith ancestor in here? And click OK. And then it shows me what results there are for Smiths and I can click on it and it's going to bring me right to that page and I can see, hey, Ronald Smith, that's my ancestor or no, it's not. And I can see, oh, he was in this production of the Dragon of Wu Fu um, at, on this date and stuff. So I can save this image. I can you know, do whatever I want to right here is where you would save it. Um, so this kind of brings you into the digital books portion of it. But this is a great way, again, to explore 
all the different types of record collections that might be related to a different location, a different surname, diff different authors or keywords, all these kind of things that you can search in that catalog. So again, catalogs are not just for library materials, lots of great um, things that you can find in there. You also might have noticed there's some icons. So we saw like the film icon on the one that we looked at. Um, there's a couple other icons you might see. So you might see a magnifying glass. So this means that some portion of a record is indexed. Some indices are restricted. So they might be housed by a third party like Ancestry.com or Fold3. So that means you might not be able to you might not be able to search it if it's a restricted one, or maybe you have to be in that Family Search Center or the Family Search Library to search it. But also note that this, this um, magnifying glass doesn't mean that every part of the record is indexed or even that the whole collection is indexed. It might just be a small part or a portion of it. Um, so don't always bank that everything's indexed. And again, you always wanna follow up, get the original record, not just rely on that index. So if you find your ancestor in the index for the 19 cent census and you see kind of the data about them that's pulled out in that index of the census, that's great information, but you still wanna follow up and get that actual image so you can verify that in, in all that information is from that index is indexed correctly and see all the additional details that they didn't index in that index that are included on that original record. The next icon you might see is called a, a camera one. So it looks just like a camera. This means it's a digitized film that you're able to browse online. So that means you can freely look at it on Family Search. You're good to go. If you see one with a key on top, that means there are viewing restrictions. So at the beginning, if you were here, we did talk about the various restrictions that there are based on the contractual agreements between Family Search and the original record holders. Some of these mean you can access it in an affiliate library, some you can't. So you need to click on that icon every time that you see it, and then it's gonna tell you what the restrictions are for that collection and how you can access it. So like we looked at before, when I looked at that Germany one um, in that search example, you know, it said, hey, I can go to a family search center or I can go to an affiliate library to look at that collection. So it's going to tell me right there how to go about that. And I'd write down some information, which I'm going to talk about in a second, what you want to write down. And I'd bring that to that location and be able to access that record, just like I was at home. And again, be aware if you're not signed into your family search account, sometimes you do see a restricted icon, but after you sign in, it's unrestricted. So always be sure to have your account signed in before you start searching. And then again, um, the film reel, that means it's a microfilm. Um, so that means digital images aren't available at this time. So you'd either have to visit that family search library or if a family search center maybe has it locally, um, check with them or check back later to see maybe digital images are gonna be added to the website at certain time because they have gone through and digitized all of their microfilm, but you know, it, it's gonna take a long time to get that all online and all indexed. So, you know, sometimes they still have to rely on people browsing the microfilm. Uh, I also want to point out, of course, the catalog is a great place to pull up those collections you found at home that are restricted to that family search center or an affiliate library. So when you go to that affiliate library, that family search center, you want to write down the film number or the collection name and then use the catalog to search for that film in that collection again so that you can access it unrestricted. And again, where you access it depends on those restrictions for each collection. So each collection is going to be different based on those agreements that family search has with those people who own it. And again, you need to click on those icons in that catalog and the restrictions will tell you if it's locked where you can access it. So as long as it says affiliate library, you can go to an affiliate library to get it. As long as it says family search center, you can go to your family search center to get it. It has to say that in order for you to access there. So if it says just access at the family search center, don't expect to come to Appleton Public Library. We're, we're an affiliate library to get access to it because unfortunately we don't have access to it. There's nothing I can magically do to give you access to it other than tell you this is where the family search center is. This is when they're open, this is how you get there. Unfortunately, Family Search recently did discontinue what they called the record lookup service. So um, just 10 days ago on July 17th, there used to be this really awesome service that they had during the pandemic where you could, you know, fill out the request form and anything at that Family Search affiliate library or Family Search Center or even the Salt Lake City Library, they'd send you pages from it or a digital image of it. Um, but now you unfortunately need to physically go to visit these locations rather than submit that request remotely. So. Bummer that they discontinued it, but um, 
you know, now kind of the pandemic has waned down. So they're hoping that you'll be able to visit those affiliate libraries, those family search centers, or the family history library in Salt Lake City. So this is kind of a quick snapshot of what you would look um, like at home when you're looking for a restricted record. Um, so again, you know, just like we did before in our example of searching the catalog for a different location, that's what I did for this. I was searching for something in Marion County, Indiana. So this is the top part of the record, just like I looked at in our example before. If I scroll down, this is where at the bottom I'm going to see that camera with the key on top. So again, that means it's a restricted collection. If I click on it, just like I did before, earlier when we looked at that German record collection, it says there's images available, but you have to access the site at the Family Search Center or again at the affiliate library. So that means I can write down my information about it or save it to my source box, and I can bring that to Appleton Public Library, where we're an affiliate library, and get access to this collection. So again, that means um, we do have access to some of the restricted collections being an affiliate library. And if you want to view all of the affiliate libraries or family search center locations, you can click on that little map pin icon on the upper right corner of the family search site. So it's available on any page of family search that you can click on it. It looks just like this. And then you can search for your nearest city or town and it will show you on a map where the closest affiliate library and closest family search centers are. Unfortunately, there's no magic part of Family Search that tells you where these restricted collections are or what collections are restricted and what aren't. You just kind of need to keep track of what collections you want to view at an affiliate library or the ones you want to view at the Family Search Center. Again, when you come across one at home, as long as it says access in that affiliate library or the Family Search Center, you want to write down that film number or an image group number, the collection name. You can always keep a link to that collection or record and bring it to us at the affiliate library or the Family Search Center. Again, whichever location you can access that collection at. Again, how it has to say affiliate library for you to access it at the affiliate library. And you could even, like I said, add the record to your source box and pull that up when you log into your Family Search account. Um, so that's an easy way, instead of having to write down all these film numbers, um, you can just keep on adding things to your source box and then pull up your source box when you come to the library and then go through them one by one by one at the Family Search library or a fill, uh, center if you want to. So this is where you'd find that information. So again, you could either save this link up here, email it to yourself or save you know, a document with all the links. You could write down this collection name of circuit court order books from 1822 to 1909. Or again, I'd scroll down on this record collection and I'd see, okay, this notes field, I can write down these order books for these certain years. You know, maybe I only want to search in one or two of these, or I could write down the film number. Again, you want to write down the one that's going to correspond to the ones you want to look at, because look at, they're all different film numbers, depending on what year you're wanting to search. There's also an image group number, so similar to a film number, it's going to be different numbers depending on what years you're searching for. So again, this is all data you can write down if you find a restricted collection. You can also find the film num number up here. So after you've clicked on that um, camera with that key icon and it tells you there are images available, you can also write down the number of the film there. Or this is where you'd save it to that source box. So now I can click that button, uh, fill in a a quick little thing about it and make myself a note that says, hey, you want to search for so-and-so on such and such date. So next time I go to the affiliate library, I can pull up my source box and have all those notes, all of those films right there where I can just click on them. And again, you got to make sure that you're logged into your family search account in order to click on that source box where it's not going to work. So when I come to the affiliate library, or the Family Search Center, I can, you know, click on film or fiche or image group number. I can type in that number, or I can click on place or keywords or subjects. Any of the data that I did, if I didn't save that link or I didn't save it to my um, source box, I could type that in right there, and I'd click search just like I did before. And now I'm going to scroll down and look at this is what it looks like when I'm at Appleton Public Library, which is an affiliate library. Now that key is gone on that icon. And if I click on it, this is what happens. 
magic. I get to now look at all of these different records. I can download them. I can save them. I can print them. I can do whatever I want with them, essentially, now that I'm in an affiliate library. So that's how easy it is to pull up a restricted collection. Again, write down that film number, that collection name, save it to your source box. Those are all easy, simple, quick ways to save those restricted collections for looking up later. Remember though, there are various restrictions. You gotta make sure that you're accessing them, how you're supposed to access them based on the restrictions. So again, unfortunately, don't expect to come to an affiliate library to look up stuff that's only available at the Family Search Center. Unfortunately, there's nothing magical I can do for you. Or like you see this one, there's, you know, these are images that are only available on Fold3. So I have to have a Fold3 subscription. And that's why it's saying fees and other terms might apply because it's something that FamilySearch cannot give you access to. So you would need to have a, a Fold3 account, for example. All right, we are going to move on to the books and digital library portion of Family Search. So again, we click on search and go to books. So this is the digital library. It's a large online library of genealogical resources. So of course, you know, you think of digital library or books. Obviously, this is just like a regular library, but it's all digitized and available online for you for the most part. So there's more than 500,000 um, and growing digitized genealogies, uh, family histories, county and local histories, genealogical periodicals, gazetteers, and much, much more um, that lots of the major genealogy libraries have um, digitized and made available for you for free on Family Search. Unfortunately, there are some restricted books that you can only view at that Family Search library in Salt Lake City or at a Family Search center. Unfortunately, restricted books for some reason are just something that we're not able to access at an affiliate library. I have no clue why on um, if there's any way around it, um, I have not been able to find out. So um, again, if you come across a, a book restriction, you're gonna have to access that at a Family Search Center, which they have them all around the world. Um, so hopefully you have one pretty locally to you or the Family Search Center library um, in Salt Lake City. The other option, of course, though, if you don't have one near you or they don't have great hours for you, you can always search the title on WorldCat. So if you're not familiar with WorldCat, that is um, the world's largest library catalog. So it's essentially taking all the libraries or most of the libraries in the world and adding them into one large catalog that you can search and see if maybe there's a library closer to you that would have a copy of it. Or maybe, you know, even if it's a library further away, maybe they're able to copy the pages for you. You know, if you just need 10 pages or just somebody to look in the index and see, oh, is my ancestor's surname in there? You know, maybe they'll be able to do that for you. It's worth it to ask instead of, hey, I have to plan a whole trip to Salt Lake City to get access to this one book that I really want. Um, if you need to look at the whole book or you want to browse it, you might also be able to do what's called interlibrary loan, where you could request it through your local library. They would fill out a request form with the library that owns it and see, hey, can we possibly get this book for a short time for our patron who really wants it? They, you know, say yes or no. If they say yes, they'd mail it to us. And then you'd be able to come to the library to pick it up, check it out for a few weeks um, and, you know, be able to explore it. Unfortunately, be aware that some of the genealogy and local history books, though, are more rare. Um, so some libraries aren't as, you know, readily wanting to loan those out on interloan to people. You know, they might be books that are only available to look at in the library, or they want to make sure that they're there for their patrons, because maybe it's the only copy they have. Um, so it is possible that you might not be able to get it on interlibrary loan. There's also a really great link in your handout that discusses the various icons that you're going to find in the book viewer. Unfortunately, like I said, we just have so much to cover. We've already been here for almost two hours and we still have a little bit more to cover, so I can't dive deep into everything, um, but check out the various icons in the book viewer and what they mean with that link in the handout for you. Uh, so now I'm going to show you really quickly what it looks like to search in the digital library. And again, you see on this page before you do a search, they have search tips. Again, be sure to read through that really quick. If you've never used the digital library, this is definitely something you want to read before you start searching in it. So you can learn a little bit more about how to search effectively. So you can put any kind of keyword in here. Again, there's an advanced search that you could do, but we're just going to do a basic search since we're pretty short on time. So I can do a location. So I can put in out of Gamey County, Wisconsin, for example. 
and I can click search. And so it's going to pull up a bunch of different results. I have a ton of results up here just on out of Gamey County, uh, Wisconsin. So, you know, I can narrow it down over here if I want to narrow it down by subject, language, who owns it, all kinds of things if I wanted to, um, or I could just kind of browse through. Be aware that these do sometimes have various limitations. So this says there's actually limited permission on this particular book. So I might not be able to view all 274 pages of this book, unfortunately. But if I want to view what I can view, I can click on that view inside and it's going to bring me right into it. And so again, like this one says protected, so I might not be able to view it. So like I can click on show more and all I can see are these kind of highlights. I can't even click on the book or anything. It's not going to do anything. It's it's protected, unfortunately. So that means I have to go to the Family Search Library. So it says Due to copyright restriction, I can't view this book online. So be aware, again, that you will come across some things, unfortunately, that you still can't access on here. Again, you can search by tons of different things. You could even put in a last name. So like, for example, I'm going to put in my last name in the keyword search if I want to change my search. And I can see, look at, there's maps and all these other cool things. It's not just books. So again, look at that access level, see what's in there. It's even going to give you different international things. Like this looks German, you know, right there. It says it's German. So I can see kind of like a little preview, essentially, of what's there. Here's a yearbook from... Um, it says the aerial, so I can see, look at, there's, you know, a Mary Stilp here. So maybe this is my ancestor. I can, if I want to go right to that page that she's featured in, I can click on that highlights part and it's going to bring me right there. So now I can see she was on the judicial board um, and I can see there's a picture of her in here with a bunch of other people. So if that's my ancestor, I can go ahead and save it right there with this little dial node icon. Um, so there's lots of really great things. Again, not just books, um, there's yearbooks, maps, all kinds of genealogies, different types of things available in here. So the last little search option is the research wiki. If you are not familiar with the research wiki, you are missing out on a ton of awesome stuff. So there are more than 100,000 uh, free articles about thousands of research topics. This serves as a really great introduction to every genealogical record type and location with links to relevant digital materials, both things that are available on FamilySearch and things that aren't available on FamilySearch. It even will show you how to research these records offline if it's not available online. Unfortunately, some entries are more complete or more detailed than others. Um, you know, some of them, there just needs to be more people filling in this wiki on certain things. Um, the, the wiki also isn't a spot where you would put your ancestor's name. You want to put in something like a place or a topic or a record type or a mixture of these. So examples of what I could search in there would be birth records, and then I can learn all about what birth records are in relation to genealogy. I could type in something more specific like Wisconsin birth records, and it's going to tell me this is how you access Wisconsin birth records. Here are links to some indexes for Wisconsin birth records. Or I could type in something like German word list and it's going to show me some translation of, um, you know, what English words are and what German words are and, and all this fun stuff. So there's lots of really great resources in the Family Search Wiki if you have not yet explored. So just quickly again, I'm going to give you a little demonstration. So again, from the main Family Search page, you're going to click on Search and Research Wiki. It's going to bring you right there. Sometimes it says Search Research Wiki. Sometimes it says just Wiki. Um, I've seen it different either research wiki or wiki um, but either way it will get you to that right place so right here where it says search by place or by topic that's where you're going to put in what you want to search so again i can type in something like out of Gamey county i can just type in a, a, a place and hit out of Gamey county wisconsin it's going to kind of give you some suggested titles so like this if i click on it this is an actual wiki entry all about out of Gamey County, Wisconsin, and researching here. So it tells you things like, oh, this is what the county was named for. Um, this is when the county was formed. This is the county seat. All this kind of great information, where the courthouse is, a link to their website, all this kind of great stuff. Key dates on when they started certain record sets, all this kind of stuff. If there's a known, known courthouse fire or something like that, you know, it's going to give you all this detail. You can click on all these different cities or villages and other areas around here to learn a little bit more. Again, sometimes things are a little bit more detailed than others. So you can see down here, there's nothing listed on Bible records or businesses or anything. Um, there's 
a little bit on cemeteries, you know, as you scroll down, you see some things are completely blank, some things there's links, some things there's lots of stuff. So again, they have this for a lot of counties, a lot of states, a lot of countries all around the world um, that you can search for to learn a little bit more about researching in this area. And then again, down here, you can see there's all these different indexes. If I want to search this birth index from 1820 to 1907, I can just click on it and get brought right to it. I can even see there's how to use that collection thing that I showed you before that you'd want to research and learn a little bit more before you start diving in. So again, lots of cool stuff. Um, I just want to quickly show you there's um, international ones. So again, if you click on that topic and start typing, I can type in like Pomerania genealogy. So if you have Prussian ancestors from Pomerania, like I have no clue where to begin how to ser start searching these Prussian ancestors of mine. So now I can read all about Pomerania, I can get some historical background, all these links over here, like that German word list I mentioned before, you can click on it and it's going to bring you to a different section of the wiki and it will show you all these cool things like these are how to type the numbers, these are different spelling things or things that you should know about the language, all this kind of great stuff. These are all the words for birth in German, for example. So all helpful things that you would want to know as you start diving into genealogy research in this given location or in a given record set. So lots of great stuff in the wiki. All right, the next tab we're gonna move into, and we're gonna move this, through this one pretty quickly because we're pretty tight on time here. We've been here almost two hours. So thanks for all you guys hanging in on me and listening to me talk and talk and talk. Um, so this memories tab is a really cool area if you haven't yet explored it of the site. So if you click on overview, it's going to give you various aspects of the mem memories area, kind of, of course, give you an overview of what is involved in the memories area. If you click on gallery, which is the next option, that's going to bring you to where you have uploaded any content. So you can see all the things you've added in one spot. So say you've added 200 pictures, you can click on gallery and go through all your 200 pictures that you have added to Family Search. You can even organize them in certain albums. So for example, if you have those 200 photos and 20 of them are your Smith ancestors, you can do it uh, an album of just those 20 photos and then the other 30 photos that are for your Johnson ancestors, those can be in a different album, for example, but you can still all find them in that gallery area. The next option is people. So if you click on that, that's going to bring you to a list of all the people you have uploaded and attached a memory to. And be aware, you actually don't have to attach a memory to somebody if you don't want to. So you can upload photos and just leave them unattached if you want to. Um, but if you do attach them to certain people, if you click on that people area, that's going to bring you right to their um, area. And so you can click on them and then be brought into the family tree for those certain people. And again, I'll show you a demonstration in a minute of what that looks like. And then the Find tab, that's where you probably want to spend a good amount of time. So this is where you can actually search through what has been uploaded by other people on Family Search. See if you can locate some awesome photos or some stories on your ancestors. So lots of great things to be found in the Memories area. So you, of course, can add your own family photos, stories, documents, and or audio recordings. But of course, before you add any information, you do have to agree to the Family Search Content Submission Agreement. It basically says you have permission to upload the content. You're allowing Family Search to do whatever it wants with it. Uh, you, of course, want to exercise discretion. If you're going to be putting anything on here, you don't want shared or searched because it's going to be available publicly unless you mark it as private. Um, if you're mentioning anybody or anything about people who are still living, you're, of course, going to want to ask if they're okay with that information being online and being searchable before you do that. That's just the right thing to do. And then again, that Find tab. Um, that's where you're going to search through what's been uploaded by other people. You're also going to likely see those things attached to your ancestors in that family tree portion. So remember before when we looked at my ancestor, Emerson C. Thompson, I could see under memories tab, there was one thing listed and it was a photo of her. So I could either have found that through that memories tab um, in this section of the site or through the family tree in her um, profile page under memories. So kind of they're in both locations essentially. The cool thing is you can even search by text, so like an ancestor's name or a subject, or they have what's called topic tags, which are user contributed tags. So people have tagged things recipes, for example, so you can put your grandma's pumpkin pie recipe, take it as recipe, and then if you have other recipes for your family that you've uploaded, then anytime you type in recipe, you can find all those family recipe photos that you've attached on there. 
All right, so here's a quick demonstration of what it looks like in the Memories tab. Just give me one second. All right, so again, this is the overview page. So this is um, when you would click on Memories, it would give you a little bit more information about the Memories area, talks to you about sharing your memories, all that kind of fun stuff, how you can even create a slideshow and all that fun stuff. Um, but if you want to, we're going to just go right to the gallery. So again, you can see I've uploaded two things. I've uploaded a photo. I've uploaded an article. I haven't spent a whole time, a ton of time uploading stuff on people um, at this point, or I haven't tagged things that I've uploaded. If I click on people, that's going to, again, bring me to people who have memories attached to them that I could then click on them and be brought to their family tree portion of the page. And now I can see, oh, here's this great photo of my second great grandfather. And look at, he's like in a train conductor uniform. And it's even the person who uploaded actually says they got it from Find a Grave and it was posted by me. So it's my photo, but somebody else uploaded it to Family Search because I didn't yet upload it. So this is where they got it from. Kind of funny. And then again, if you go under find, that's where you're going to be able to search for yourself. You can search by your ancestor's name um, if you have that search text selected or the, the topic tag. So I'll show you both ways how to search. So the first one I'm going to search, I'm just going to put in a last name just to keep it simple for right now and click search. So now I can see there's different photos of these stilps. There's, here's an obituary for Jacob Stilp. So this could be the obituary that I was talking about that mentions his birth, or not his birth date, his marriage date. And it sure is, it's right there. Um, there's, you know, somebody took a screenshot of Find a Grave. There's all these kinds of things that people have uploaded. So you can click on anything you'd be interested in. And again, be brought into some more detail of, you know, maybe what description, who added it. I can click on that person's name. Some people even list their email address, so you might be able to contact them that way or send them a message through Family Search. You can see who's it who it is attached to. Uh, if you go under Actions, that's where you'd be able to download it, or you can add it to your own albums, things like that. So you can find lots of really cool things in here. If we go back to that find memories part, this is where you can again also search for that topic tag. So select topic tag. You could search by certain wars, things like that. So say I'm going to type in recipe, for example. You have to select a certain topic tag. Let's see. There we go. You have to make sure to select it. It won't just search unless you've selected a certain tag, because again, these are user contributed tags. So if you don't tag things properly, it's not gonna show up in the results, but these are all different things that people have tagged as being recipes. So you can find some cool things to make for your next family gathering or for dinner tomorrow night. All right, next we have the Get Involved tab. Um, so this is where you can do certain volunteer opportunities through Family Search. Um, so the overview button is going to tell you more about the activities that are available on Family Search to volunteer. If you click on My Opportunities, that's going to be specific projects for you. So specific indexing collections that might be available for you, for example. And then the indexing button, so that's the main volunteer thing at Family Search, where you can start typing things in that you want people to be able to find eventually on Family Search. So it's going to bring you right here into the indexing section where you can find a project, you can see your progress that you've made on certain indexing things, you can even see groups that you might be a part of. So like, for example, some genealogy societies all work on an indexing project together, and they might create a specific group where you all could interact with each other and um, type in, you know, issues you might be having indexing with that collection or something like that, or just, you know, get to know other people who are working on that same project um, with you, for example. So this is the spot of the site where you can volunteer your time um, and to make genealogy resources more accessible. It's an all online volunteer project. And again, the most common one is indexing where you're viewing the Im an image, you're reading what you think it says and typing what you think it says. And this makes the information searchable. Eventually, there is a little bit of a process before it does become searchable because of course, multiple different people have to um, do the indexing to make sure that they're being accurate. And then people need to review it before it becomes live. So you can do as much or as little 
uh, or spend as much or as little time as you'd like to. It's completely optional. You know, it's been quite a few years since I've indexed just because I just don't have enough time, unfortunately, to volunteer to index very much. But, you know, when I get a chance every now and then, you know, my, I might index a few here and there. You also get a choice of what's available for the available collections to index. So maybe you can pick one that might help your research. If, for example, you have a Pennsylvania ancestor and they have some Pennsylvania church records that you want to index. So that'd be cool that you can help contribute to something that might be more specific to your ancestor. And you never know, maybe you stumble across your ancestor when you're indexing that collection. There's also the options to do what they call name review. So kind of double checking that, you know, somebody who typed in something is doing the right thing or improving place names. So if you looked before when we were typing in Appleton, Wisconsin, you know, there's the option to pick Appleton, Outagamie, Wisconsin. That's like the proper place name. You know, so sometimes people, when they're typing things in to the family tree, they aren't, you know, including that full complete name. So they're trying to get people to improve those a little bit, things like that. Um, so again, these are all completely volunteer, completely optional things that you can or can, don't have to do on FamilySearch, but something cool. Uh, before you can start indexing, there is a little tour that you have to take, kind of like a little introduction, where it gives you a sample one, you type in again what you think it says right there, so you're kind of reading over here, typing over there, and it even will tell you, hey, that's correct, you did a great job, um, and then you can move on to the next thing and next thing, and kind of you need to pass this, I guess, in order to move on and be allowed to index. This is where it what it looks like when you can select an indexing project. So again, there's multiple different things. You can even see what level of indexing it is. So maybe if you're a beginning indexer, you don't want to do something that's intermediate because it's saying it's a little bit harder to index. You know, maybe get some indexing that's easier under your belt before trying to pick one of those intermediate or advanced ones. You could even do it in different languages too. If you happen to know multiple languages, that'd be something really great to index. And then that last tab is going to be the activities tab. So this is where there are a variety of activities centering around family history. You can um, do things like see if you're connected to any famous relatives. Of course, you do need to be a part of that family tree because that's where they're grabbing that data from. You can compare your faces to faces of your relatives through photos. So again, you'd need to upload a photo of yourself, have some photos of your, of your relatives um, available on the family tree. You could record a story, you could add your face to historical photos, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. There's all kinds of cool things. If you just click on them, you can learn a little bit more about what it is before you dive in. Again, these are all optional kind of fun things that you can do or not do. I personally have never explored any of them. I'm too busy exploring other parts of the site and trying to find all cool um, historical records on my ancestors to have played with any of these, but the people who have played with them say they're kind of cool and fun, so feel free to explore on your own. And then just quickly, I want to talk through these upper right-hand corner options when you're signed in, because there's a couple different icons, so I want to tell you what they mean quick. So that little pin icon I talked to you a little bit about before, um, but this is the About Family Search Center part and where you can search for the different locations of the different centers and the different affiliate libraries. The next one you're going to see is the globe. So that's where you can change the, the language of the site. So the site is available in multiple different languages because it is a worldwide site. The default, of course, is going to be English. So I'm assuming that's what the majority of you will be using. The next one you're going to see is a little question mark. So this is the help section. You can click on it at any point and I'll talk to you just briefly about um, kind of what that looks like in a second. The next one you're going to see is the messages section. So this is how you can communicate with other users. So like you saw before, I can click on a username, I can send them a message. When they respond back, I'm going to see this little red dot, and that means I have unread messages. So I can click on that when I sign in and see, hey, I have a new message. Now I can read that message and respond. And then the little bell icon, that's a notification. So again, the red dot is going to mean you have unread notifications. So some of the notifications you could get would be, hey, there's been changes made to somebody you follow on the family tree. So remember earlier when we talked about family tree, you could follow your ancestors and anytime a change has been made, you can get like a weekly notification then that a change has been made to, you know, these five ancestors, for example. Then you'll see your name um, when you're signed in. So this is where you would go to manage your account and I'll talk a little bit about all the kind of cool things that you can do under there in a second. 
just quickly. Um, so again, the help icon, this is the question mark icon. So this is going to allow you to search for different topics, different articles, different lessons. You can even search a location to bring up some learning tools about that location. Um, there's a spot with all these suggested topics. So those are going to change depending on whatever page you are on at the time that you click that help icon. So say I was on the memories tab uh, when I click that help icon, well, all these suggested topics then are going to be related to adding those memories or how to add a memory, things like that, um, to that icon or to, to the site. Um, the help and learning section down here, that's going to give you links to helpful information to help you learn a little bit more about using the site. And you can even go there to sign up for a 20-minute virtual research consultation. Um, so if you're really struggling in your research, you just want to talk to somebody about maybe what do I do next? Um, you can sign up and a volunteer through Family Search will contact you to set up a time to do a consultation with you virtually to talk a little bit more about your research with you. You can click the contact us to contact Family Search if you need to for whatever reason. There's a cool community site um, where they have some messages boards. You could even get assistance on your research. Like I've seen people post things like, hey, I need this German baptism record translated. And they post it on the German um, community board and people will help them translate it. Or I'm struggling with this word or trying to find things for this. You know, people will give lots of really great resources and feedback. And then finally, the helpful resources um, link, that's where you can learn more about getting started, some research tips, lots of really great things. So when I click on community, this is, um, again, under the help thing. So I'd click that little kind of question mark and click on community. So you can see all these different, you know, things that you can search within the community. You can search the family search help area. You can suggest things that you might want to be able to make family search better. Or there's the groups section. So this is where you'd find some of those message boards that I was just mentioning. I was going to click in quick and show you what that looks like. So sometimes you need to kind of click sign in again if you go to this community part. Um, but usually if you click sign in, it will kind of remember that you were already signed in still from um, regular family search. So sometimes it just takes a second to kind of sign you back into the community part. And it's just the same username and password if you do end up having to re-enter that. My computer's just taking some time to think now. Well, geez, it's really taken some time to think. Well, they do have um, lots of great message boards. So like I said, lots of location-based ones. So like there's a German one, there's a Midwest one. I'm not sure why it's not working for me. Maybe they're having some issues with the site or maybe my internet's getting a little funky. It is looking a little dark out there, like we might get some storms. So for whatever reason, I can't show that to you right now. But um, again, you can search any kind of groups and things that they would have under there. And again, they have lots of really great research areas um, for you to explore. Um, the messages icon, so this is what it looks like when you send and receive a message. So you can see I did a little test message with our um, reference desk to show you what it looks like to send a message and receive a message. It also has some icons down here. So this is where you'd enter your message. You could also do this little like birthday cake looking thing I think it looks like. It says share reservation. Whenever I've clicked on it, nothing has happened. So I don't know if you have to have an appointment or something with, with Family Search in order to share a reservation. I'm, I'm actually not quite sure what that button does. Uh, if anybody knows, feel free to type into the chat if you've ever used that button and had success. The one that looks like a photo, that's where you can share a memory. So one that you've uploaded personally, you can share it with that person, for example. But you can see, actually, I tried to do it in the test message and it didn't come through for whatever reason. So, you know, double check that it, it works, obviously, when you're going to send things like that. And then the paperclip icon, that's where you can upload a memory. So that's going to bring you to up the process of uploading a new memory to add to your memory box, to add to that memory section that we looked at a few minutes ago. And then this is your bell icon. So again, these are notifications. So you can see I'm getting weekly changes to all the people I view or all the people I follow. So this person that I follow, I can just click on her name and I can see there's different changes that have been made. If I click on view activity, that's also going to be another spot where it's going to give me kind of a listing of all of the great, um, you know, things that have been changed, who's changed it, things like that. So if I click on it quick, I can show you what that looks like. So again, if I click on a person's name, for example, I'd click on their name again to be brought into their page. And like we looked at towards the beginning, if you click down here, 
you can see the latest changes. So you can see that notification I got was about a birth record being changed. I can see who changed it. If you click show all, that's going to give you that more detail. So I can see sources are attached. I can see what's been changed. I can see, you know, things have been deleted or, you know, if pe people have added reasonings and stuff like that, I can see all that kind of great information that people have done for changes. And again, if I click on their name, I can send them a message. Sometimes people will list their email address there. Sometimes they won't. Um, sometimes people will respond to messages. Sometimes they don't, um, you know, just like with any other site. But if I go back to that um, notifications part, again, I can um, see all the different notifications. If I have unread ones, you know, it should show you a red icon, but sometimes it doesn't always. You know, maybe since I clicked on the most recent one, it thinks I've kind of read them all, even though I have one that's unread. But if I click on view activity, that's going to give me a whole listing of all of the different changes I've made recently or that other people have made right recently. So again, you can kind of see all the different things that have been changed recently what's been added, even like photos and things that are attached to people. So lots of really great things that you can see on that following tab. All right, then finally, managing your account. So these are where you do all the kind of account related things. So if you click on settings, after you click on your name, that's going to be where you can change any information in your profile. You can change your password, a notification setting. So like I get a weekly notification via email that there's changes to people I follow in my family tree instead of always relying on that bell icon um, on family search. And you can also change certain permissions and things like who can contact you, who can see your stuff, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so again, play around with that. You know, we could spend a whole you know 20 minutes probably diving into all this stuff, but we're already super long. So thanks again, everybody, for sticking with me. Um, this next one is called family groups. So this is where you can actually create a group of contacts that you can send a message to. So for example, say you have two cousins that you three are all working on you know, genealogy together. Well, all three of you can be on one message instead of you messaging one of your cousins and then messaging the other cousin. Now all three of you can be on that same message. Contacts, if you see, anytime you click on somebody's profile name, um, you can click on add contact. And then if you want to find those contacts again, they're all listed under that contacts button. The source box, so we kind of talked about that a little bit before when we were looking at those catalog records where you could save things that you want to look at at the affiliate libraries or a family search center or even the, the family history library in Salt Lake City. So that's where you can save records. You can save catalog records, books, even external resources. Like if you find cool find a grave stuff and you want to create a source and then attach that to your person and family tree, you can start at the source box with that add that source first and then go into the family tree and add it, or you could do it vice versa, where you start in the family tree, create a new source, and then it'll be living in your source box. And then sign out, of course, this is where you'd want to sign out of your account. And that's recommended, of course, if you are on a shared computer, like if you're at the library, you don't want to leave your account signed in, um, for example, or if you share a computer with somebody, of course. But um, you can also, you know, if you are the only person using your computer, um, you can click a button when you first sign into Family Search that says, keep me signed in for two weeks. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, though. Sometimes I feel like I've had to sign in every single time I've used the site, but that's okay. All right, then just quickly, I want to show you just a little bit about the source box, because um, this is a really great feature of the site where you can add sources you might want to refer back to later. You can even create folders of research. So for example, I've created a folder of research I need to do in an affiliate library. I've created a folder just for a specific surname. I've created another for folder of research I need to do yet that I haven't quite gotten to. Um, so things I want to refer back to later or do more research in, things like that. You can even, again, see sources that I personally have created and added. Like I added the Find a Grave for Emerson C. Scott. Um, and I added that to her family tree page then. So you can see some of those sources in that source box. So again, you'd click on your username and source box, and that'll bring you right into here. So this is where I could create a source. So I could, you know, start new. I could add whatever information I have on that specific source. Like if it's a source on a different website, like Find a Grave or Ancestry, or I located it offline, I could even, you know, add details here about that. And then when I'm done, I just click save, and it would be in my source box. Anytime I'd want to attach it to somebody, I could click attach, and I'd select um, I'd either search by name or that ID number sometimes is helpful to have if you're going to attach a lot of sources to the same person. You may be writing down that ID number quickly is a quick way to find them instead of having to search by them by name all the time. 
And again, you can kind of refer back to these. Um, you can click on them, see there's links on them like our look at this affiliate library research. So this is where I've saved those things I need to look at when I'm at Appleton Public Library, which is an affiliate library. So I can go into my source box now, I can click on this, I can click on that link. And now next time I'm in the library, it, it'll you know magically work because I'm not in the library, it's not magically gonna work, but I could do that. And then I can click out of it. I can go to the, my next source, click it, and then go right down the row. So that's why I always encourage people to save those records you wanna search at the affiliate library, at the Family Search Center in the source box, because you can go really quickly instead of having to search through the catalog every time to pull up that record again. And see, I even wrote a little note, like I'm looking for John Smith. This is obviously an example just to show you guys, because. If I'm looking for John Smith, I'm going to be looking for a long time. Um, but this is, you know, a quick and easy way where I could just click on that, click on that link really quick and get that record and go record to record really fast when I'm at the affiliate library. All right, we are nearing the end. I have a couple of quick tips and then we are opening it up for questions. So there are some overlap of collections with Ancestry and Ancestry Library Edition. So a lot of people ask me, well, what, what one do I use? Do I use Ancestry? Do I use Family Search? Well, they each have their own unique collections. So you want to use them both. You know, there's tons of collections that are only available on Ancestry. There's tons of collections that are only available on Family Search. There's also collections that they both have. Um, and image quality actually differs on both those different sites or on other genealogy sites. So for example, if you come across a collection on either one of these sites, so you come across the 1910 census for your ancestor, maybe it's really blurry or difficult to read or really dark, try opening it up on Family Search, try opening it up on Ancestry. There's gonna be a difference in between those two images because they've digitized them at different times and indexed them differently. Indexes are different, the image quality is different. Um, so see which one's gonna be easier for you to find, which one's gonna be more readable for you. So I always encourage you to use both. If you're not familiar with wildcards, we can't get into a whole topic on it today, but um, wildcards are something that you can use to search and you can use them on Family Search. So they essentially replace certain characters or letters in your search. So say you have a really common name and it can be smelt different ways. So you could use a question mark to replace one letter. You could use a star to replace between zero and five characters. Um, so, you know, for example, if you're searching Matthias, well, that could be spelt with one T or two Ts. It could be spelt, you know, several different ways. Or maybe I want to search for Matilda with an H, without a H, things like that. I can use wild cards because, you know, maybe the name for my ancestor is misspelled across multiple different records, depending on whoever wrote it. Maybe they used one T, maybe they used two Ts, for example. I can use wild cards to find both of those. I also want to encourage you to broaden your location search. So, you know, people, you know, always want to try to drill down as far as possible to Appleton, the city. Well, don't forget the county or for, don't forget that boundaries have changed. Appleton is actually part of three different counties. I know people mostly recognize that it's part of Outagamie County, but it's also a little bit of part of Calumet County and Winnebago County. Um, so there could be other record sets that you're missing if you're only looking at Outagamie County or only looking at Appleton. Um, you know, again, like I said before, you know, maybe certain collections are under the state or under national record collections. So don't always narrow it down to to the, the smallest level or the city, the town, you know, look at the county, look at the state, look at national as well. Or sometimes search without a location, you never know what you're gonna get. Maybe you find your ancestor in an unexpected place. Be aware, of course, new collections are added weekly. So if you don't find something you're looking for now, check back periodically. Because again, you know, those agreements with Family Search and the original people who own those records are gonna be changing constantly. So, you know, they, always have, you know, really great things that they're adding constantly, um, things that are restricted or unrestricted, vice versa. So lots of really great things that you can find on Family Search and continue finding. Of course, I couldn't cover everything today. So there is a really great book um, that Do Dana McCullough did back in 2020. It is, of course, you know, almost three years old at this point, but it does really go in depth into using the site. It has some screenshots. Of course, those screenshots are a bit out of date because they're constantly making improvements on the site, but the navigation is essentially the same. And there's lots of really great, you know, tips and tricks that, of course, you know, are really great to learn more a little bit about how to use the site and, you know, a little bit more specifics of how to do things that I couldn't cover in the almost two and a half hours I've been here already.
There's also some really great monthly classes and webinars that will teach you how to use FamilySearch more. And um, you can get notifications actually to your email of what upcoming classes there are. They even have recordings of some past classes. They have over 2,000. So not only do they talk about how to use Family Search more, but they do specific, you know, record things like some specialized things like reading Dutch records or discovering your Mayflower ancestors or all about Denmark probate records. So there's tons of great stuff that you can find on here. And of course, I have a link to you to this in your handout, but it's a part of the Family Search Wiki. So you can see all the past webinars are here, all the upcoming ones are here. You can even see they do them in different languages because again, Family Search is worldwide. They do them, you know, in Spanish, Chinese, Swedish, all this kind of cool stuff. You can even get handouts here of past ones that maybe you missed, or you can click here to register. And again, these are all awesome things that they would offer that they would go more in depth. So like there's all about searching on Family Search. Well, that's probably an hour, hour and a half where I only could cover it in, you know, 20 minutes maybe of this whole huge presentation I've done for you. So if you're looking for some more help, that's a great place to start. And then if you're not familiar, um, Family Search does this yearly event called Roots Tech. So it's a really awesome conference. Um, this past year, um, they do it every March. So they did it in person and online, but the years before that they did online, of course, during the pandemic. But the awesome thing is that they have all these videos available on demand. Um, so you can log into this Roots Tech part of the site and search the whole entire library of certain topics or things that you're looking for. So for example, if I'm looking for some more information on how to search my German ancestors, I can type in Germany and I can see there's 41 different videos on genealogy research related to Germany. So I can, you know, watch this Catherine Schober one on German vital records. That's going to be awesome. And, you know, sometimes they're really long, like an hour, or sometimes they're 10 minutes or 20 minutes. So again, these are really great resources to learn more about researching in this area or researching things more in depth that, um, you know, definitely you can watch anytime uh, when you can't sleep or when you're looking for more inspiration on researching your ancestors. And then finally, I did want to tell you, I do offer that one-on-one -on -one local history and genealogy help through the library. It's a free 45-minute one-on-one -on -one session where I can help you learn how to use either our local history or genealogy resources or just sit with you and talk with you a little bit about your research problems that you're having and maybe give you some, some, some suggestions on where to go next. Um, so again, this is a link in your handout. I offer it either free via Zoom if you don't live in the Appleton area or if you'd like to visit me at the library, I do it in person as well where I, I can walk you through or sit with you for a little bit to chat with you about genealogy or local history. So feel free to fill that out if you'd like to make an appointment with me. And that's all I've got for you. Again, thank you all for hanging out with me for this long. Now I finally take a look at the Q&A box and see what kind of great stuff you guys have for me to see what kind of questions I can answer. Let me stop sharing my screen here and see what we've got in the Q&A. <clears throat> Is there a handout? Yes, there was. So let me type the link to that again for you. Sorry, I wasn't able to share it throughout the whole session, but I was a little busy. All right, what if someone has added info to a family tree um, without documentation? Well, you know, unfortunately, people do that. Um, you can contact them and see if they potentially have some documentation on where they got it from. Um, you know, they might respond, they might not, or you can use that information, like I said, for a hint. And then um, I can turn my video back on, sorry. Should turn my video back on. There you go. Um, you can use that information that you find on the family tree as a hint and then, you know, try to find your own resources for it as well. So, you know, unfortunately, not everybody is as thorough, thorough and as documented as we'd all like to be. Um, and again, always use that stuff as hints. So on the family tree, can someone declare a living person as deceased? I can see how personal information could be released this way. Potentially they could. Um, you know, that's something you might need to contact Family Search about if you do discover a living person as deceased. I haven't yet personally, but you know, I guess it theoretically could happen. Um, I don't think there's any proof that you have to have that that person's deceased. Um, you just have to kind of mark it as deceased, I guess. So that's something that, yeah, might cause a little problem, I guess, if you do come across any living people. 
So info, which you know is wrong. The kind drives me crazy. People guess a lot. Yeah. So if you find information which you know is wrong, you can definitely edit that and change it on a family tree. You want to obviously give as much documentation as possible so that people don't change it and that people know that you know what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, people are going to keep adding documentation that, you know, they think is the right person, but it's not you know, or they heard something and they added it, you know, there, that's the downfall of having one big tree that anybody can add it, add, add and edit to, but there's also lots of really great things with family trees. So definitely, you know, still look at it and still use it as a resource. So another, what if someone has added info to a family tree with incorrect or undocumented information? Yes, again, you know, you can add it you can edit it, you can change it, um, you can reach out to them, tell them, hey, this is why I, I know this is incorrect. Like I mentioned earlier about my August and Amelia, there's people who constantly are adding these wrong kids to my August and Amelia because there's another August and Amelia that lived in the same area at the same time period. They just had different kids. They were from different areas, lots of different stuff about them, but people keep intertwining them because they have the same names. So I've reached out to a couple people on there and just told them this is the information I have. If you want further information, I'm happy to share, but you know, sometimes people, they just want to, you know, think that you're wrong or not believe you, or there's other people who come across and are new to genealogy all the time who are adding incorrect or undocumented information, and there's nothing we can do to stop them, unfortunately. That's why I also recommend, you know, keeping your own family tree information separate off of family search, like in a genealogy software, in your own like ancestry tree or whatever you want to do to make sure that it's something that nobody else can edit as well as having that family tree on family search. All right, I have been told several times about nightmares trying to get incorrect information which has been added to the tree removed by the originator. Is there any way to, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, like I said, you can change, you can edit stuff, you can put any documentation you want, um, but that person can go right behind you and undo it and keep adding their incorrect stuff. Um, I know Family Search did just recently add like a sticky note thing where there's like a, a note you can put as like important and it will show up at the top of the notes where, you know, you would hope people would read it so you can lay out your information on why you think that person's incorrect or, you know, why this is the correct information, things like that, and hope that people read it. But again, you know, that's what happens when you have a tree that anybody can add and anybody can edit stuff. If you don't know a person's given name, can you search just using a surname? Yeah, you absolutely can. Um, you are probably going to get more results depending on how common of a surname. Um, but you, yeah, like I said, play with the search for play different dif different ways you know sometimes if you search by parents names or siblings names like i found ancestors so many different weird ways that you wouldn't have ever thought to try to search and you know you can just put in a search uh, a surname you can put in a location you can put in dates you can try any different types of searches and get different results every time where do I post a record that I found somewhere other than on Family Search? So that's where you would go to the source box. So you can create a source right in the source box, or if you go in through the family tree, that's where you could add a source under that source tabs, and it would prompt you to create that source, put in that information that you know about that source, and that's going to allow you to then attach it to the tree. So you can put find a grave stuff on there, whatever you find offline, anything like that. If I search records and add some info to my tree, then what do I do with the tree to save it? As you said, someplace where no one can change it. Where is that and how to do it? So there is no way to magically save it after you've added it to Family Search. Um, you can go back and see what changes have been made on Family Search to see like what you had originally put. But I would like do do a copy offline, like have printed document of your your pedigree chart and fill it out by hand or like I said have a genealogy software where you are the only one who can access it or have an, an ancestry tree it's kind of like duplicating that information elsewhere but there's no magical way to just save all your stuff on family search you can print like family group sheets and pedigree charts and stuff but you'd have to almost always print it you know constantly to keep up with the how often you're researching so it's almost better to um you know just do it elsewhere without you know kind of duplicating that information elsewhere um it's cumbersome unfortunately that's why i personally don't spend a whole ton of time adding and updating on family tree on family search but whatever you guys want to do that's 
up to you. We all have our own ways of researching and how we keep our research. Um, but personally for me, I want something I know is accurate. So I'm documenting my tree on Ancestry, for example, and I keep it a tr private tree or I have Roots Magic. I can document my tree in there. I know there are some genealogy programs that do work with other, um, you know, genealogy websites and things like some of them sync with Family Search or some of them will sync with Ancestry. So that's an option as well. What is the web address of the Family Search site? It's www.familysearch.org. Or you can easily just go to Google and type in Family Search and it will come up. It's probably the first result, but familysearch.org. And it's at the top of your handout as well. How do I get an original record that you discover in an index? Well, that's a great question. So sometimes in that how to use the collection um, part where it talks about what the collection is and that stuff, it will give you some more information. Sometimes it's just you need to dig a little bit, maybe contact the local library in that area or find out who the original record um, custodian is. So usually in Family Search, when you go to a certain record collection, it will tell you where that information came from. So let me share my screen again and see if I can pull up a collection quick. So I'll go back to Family Search and go to Search. Let's pull up that Wisconsin Marriages ones, for example, again. So if I go to this Wisconsin Marriage ones, I can you know click on that, how to use the collection, or I can see, so this database is an index based on data collected by the Genealogy Society of, of Salt Lake City. Well, that's not super helpful. That's telling me that's where that came from. Um, but sometimes it'll say like, um, it's microfilm from the court records from the Register of Deeds office or such and such. So it kind of gives you a little hint sometimes in that citation. Um, that's another point I didn't make in this talk, though, is make sure to record your source citations of where you're getting this stuff as you're saving it, because it's important to source where you're getting stuff from. Um, but again, you know, look, usually in this area is where it will tell you where to find it from. Um, but again, sometimes you have to use that, how to use the collection or the Family Search Wiki. So I could go into the Family Search Wiki, I could type in Wisconsin Marriages, and it's going to tell me, oh, I can get Wisconsin Marriages from the Register of Deeds office. So I can type in Wisconsin Marriages. And of course, it's going to bring me to Wisconsin Vital Records. And now it's going to tell me where I can search them online. It's going to tell me how, when they started all this fun stuff. So you kind of have to read through this and see, you know, additional help or where you can find it offline. Or sometimes you might be able to find it on other genealogy sites as well. All right. Will this be available to watch again on YouTube? Yes, it will, thankfully. Um, so I hopefully will have it at some point tomorrow, probably late morning early afternoon. And again, you'll be getting an email with a recording link as well as the handout again. Handout again, someone asked for, here you go. If a father or mother are deceased, is there any way to see who were their children even if still living? Nope, if they're still living on, on family search, you cannot see who they are um, unless they happen to be in some historical records that you locate. Um, like, you know, some people will post like an obituary for the father or mother who are deceased, and it's going to, of course, maybe possibly list those children that are living. So there's, of course, ways around it, but it, to see their family tree page, you're not going to be able to because they're living. Is family search similar to Ancestry? I had a subscription several times that I let lapse. I'm a newbie, so perhaps I'm not getting the full benefits. Is it possible to do an Ancestry program sometime? I actually did one last year. Um, so you can find that on our YouTube channel. It's www.youtube.com slash APLREF. I'm putting it in the chat for you guys. Um, so there's one all on using Ancestry. The difference is a little bit between using Ancestry Library Edition and um, the paid edition. Um, so that was a whole like hour and a half, almost two hours of me going through trying to use Ancestry a little bit more effectively, teaching you guys about searching and stuff like that, kind of like I did tonight with Family Search. Um, so that's part of the reason why I did this one, because everybody said I did such a great job doing the Ancestry one that they wanted more. So um, that's uh, on our YouTube channel and available for you guys to watch. Can you download and save a document from Family Search and then save it to your Ancestry account? You sure can. Yeah, so anywhere you see that download button on Family Search, you can go ahead and download it and then upload it into the gallery of Ancestry. And I mean, I don't think there's any rules against it. Um, I don't know. I'm not a copyright lawyer or anything like that. So that's up to you if you'd like to do that or not. 
how should I start? Search for me, my parents, my kids, or upload a GEDCOM file, a homemade family tree, search for a relative, or just start adding everyone I can't find via searching. Completely up to you. Um, you know, there's, it depends on what you want to do with your research. What is your research goal? Do you want to find everybody back all the way back to Adam and Eve? I mean, that you always start with yourself and then go back generation by generation by generation. Um, see what's already been added in the family search family tree, see what's been added in the historical records. I mean, I can't tell you exactly where to start. The, the starting point for everybody is going to be a little bit different, depending on what information's already been done on your family, what's already been researched. So just start wherever seems easiest for you. Someone said, I was listed as deceased based on my father's obituary. After writing to Family Search, they made the correction to make me a living person again. So they're resurrected. Well, yeah, so it can happen that unfortunately living people are marked as deceased, but thankfully you provide proof that, to Family Search that you're still living and they're correct that for you and get you unliving or give, get you living again. If I save a record to the tree only available at Family Search Library, or the Family Search Center or an affiliate, is it still available to me to view once I am home? So if you attach it to the tree and you don't save that actual images, no. Once you go back home and click on that link again, it's going to say, nope, you have to access me in the Family Search Library or the Family Search Center or the affiliate. But if you download a copy of that image or do a screenshot of it or something like that, then you will be able to pull that up again. However, you print a copy of it, then you'd, you'd want to save your own copy of it and not just attach it to your person in the family tree. So you got to kind of do two steps in order to be able to access it again. Would you consider a presentation explaining the source citation process as it relates to the Family Tree Maker software? I sure would. Um, I personally don't use Family Tree Maker, but I could definitely see if I can find an expert for Family Tree Maker and see if we can get a Family Tree Maker uh, presentation eventually. Thanks for the suggestion. All right, those were all the Q&As that I saw. I'm, there might be ones in the chat if I missed them. I'm sorry. Thank you again, everyone, for holding on. If you do have any other questions, I'm going to scroll through the chat real quick. But again, feel free to join us. Um, in two weeks, we have our next family. We have our next Find Your Ancestors presentation, August 10th, 6 p.m. Central. We're going to have Mary Riso talking about the genealogy of a neighborhood. So. If you're running into roadblocks on finding your ancestors, maybe you need to start looking into the neighborhood and see if you're able to find your ancestor through your neighbors. So join us for that. Again, the link to join that is in the handout, and we'll be doing that in two weeks. Um, so I do see another question. Why do persons working for Family Search add records to individual? They are added a parent-child relationship to ancestor. This person works for Family Search and is not a relative. You know, so sometimes I know, you know, Family Search and other genealogy sites are experimenting with this kind of AI technology. Um, I know Family Search, of course, has tons of volunteers, so they're constantly trying to make the website more accurate, make the family trees more accurate, help people in their research to connect with their ancestors. It's kind of part of the LDS mission of, you know, helping people preserve their history and share genealogy. So that might be why somebody from Family Search or some sort of volunteer that's not related would add a record to your ancestor and family tree. When I click on maps, it looks like a current Google map. Often things have changed over 100 years. Um, are there ways to see older maps somehow to assist your research? Well, we did do a whole map presentation. Was it last year? I think at some point um, with Lee Grady from the Wisconsin Historical Society. It might have been the beginning of this year. I can't quite remember. They all seem to blend together a little bit of when they happened. Um, but there is still a video of it available on our YouTube channel. So again, youtube.com slash APLREF. And that link is in your handout. So um, there's a whole video on historic maps and how to get those resources. But yes, when you do see um, the maps either through the family tree where you're clicking in the timeline or like searching for the Family Search Centers and Affiliate Libraries, it is a current Google map. It has been reported that unindexed un records are about 80% of the total records. So yeah, there's a lot of unindexed records, guys. If you are missing, the, if you're not, um, you know, searching those unindexed records, you're missing a ton. So like I said, I think there was like 5 billion or something like that. That's a lot. Yes, the webinar will be available to watch on YouTube. I'm sending a link tomorrow with the handout and with the recording. Family Search has a lot of young interns. I was listed as deceased because I was in my husband's obituary. So yeah, unfortunately it does happen. Again, contact Family Search, they're, they're turning around for you. If a father is deceased, is there a way to see who his living children are? I think we already covered it in the, the Q&A. So thanks for using the Q&A box. Thank you. Uh, da -da. Let's see what else. 
I have been totally tongue tied after two hours. Me too, <laughs> if you couldn't tell. <laughs> um, someone says, please scan your images into Family Search with at least 300 DPI and 600 DPI is preferred. Don't use a phone because it's a, a really low TPI. So that means it's a kind of poor quality image. So they're just encouraging you to use a, a higher scan image so that we can get a better quality image in your Family Search family tree. Yeah, I don't know how I talked nonstop for over two hours either, but <laughs> I had so much to cover. Thanks again, everybody, for sticking with me. Why, when you are searching your grandmother's birth certificate, say you get excited when you find her name, then you open the file and it says birth certificate for her son. What can be done to find her birth certificate? So, of course, that's the indexing. So, when you're searching her name in Family Search, it wants to give you any records that she might be in. So, that's why it's giving you that birth certificate for somebody else that she's featured on. Um, so, you just have to kind of continue going through your results and see, or, you know, maybe narrow it down to just a collection. So, like we looked at the Wisconsin. Wisconsin marriages collection. You know, if you know she was married in Wisconsin or born in Wisconsin, you know, narrow it down to that collection and search in that collection. Maybe you'll get a little bit better, more relevant results. Maybe this should have been in two sessions. Yeah, I, I, I thought about it, but there's just so much to cover. <laughs> All right, so let's see if there's any other questions here. Someone says um, that maybe that birthday cake one, the share reservations thing, was a temple icon for LDS related things. So it might be um, LDS or temple ordinance or for church members, possibly. So I'm not an LDS member, so I have no clue. But it looks like a birthday cake, doesn't it? So, all right. Glad to hear that you, even if you're not a new user to Family Search, you still learned a tremendous amount. Thanks so much, everybody. All right. I don't see any other questions. So again, thank you everybody so much for hanging in there. I feel like I'm starting to lose my voice. So I think it's definitely time to, to say goodnight. It's gotten dark out now. So thanks again, everybody, for sticking around for almost three hours. I can't believe I talked that long. But again, thanks for joining us tonight. And I hope everybody learned a little bit of something. And feel free to reach out if you guys have any more questions. And again, we hope to see you in two weeks when we have Mary Riso on August 10th at 6 p.m. Central, where we're going to talk about the genie of a neighborhood and I can probably almost guarantee she's not going to talk for almost three hours but uh, thanks again everybody for hanging out with me tonight and good luck on your family search adventures take care good night everyone